Welcome. I call to order the June 19th, 2018 meeting of the Saline County uh, Board of Commissioners. I ask that you please silence your cell phones if you haven't already done so. Will the clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Shadwick? Here. Commissioner Sparks? Here. Commissioner Vidrickson? Here. Commissioner Weiss? Here. Commissioner White? Here. I ask that you all stand and join me in a flag salute and remain standing for a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty. We'll now move to the public forum uh, where citizens may speak on county government, usually limited to three minutes and items that are not on today's agenda. Karen Shade Salina. I put before you some information about um, Saline County's rate of diversions. This came up, there was a meeting last Monday that included Ellen Mitchell, the county attorney, many concern or several concerned citizens and um, representatives of the ACLU and I've through a scheduling mishap was not able to attend but but did see some of the handouts and I thought oh I think the county commission might be interested in this um, and the the high note of the presentation was that for you see in the the bottom graph um, that through statistics that have been compiled by the ACLU that, to be honest, Ms. M Mitchell um, has concerns about it and they're, they're agreed upon concerns. Um, Saline County from 2012 has put between 0.3 to 1.2 percent of all cases through diversion where the state average has been 5 percent and the national average has been 9 percent. And when you think about averages, well, if we're way low on the spectrum, someone's much higher on the spectrum. So it's, it's kind of hard to make estimations, but if these, if these statistics hold, um, this is a large part of the increase in the population at the jail that we've noticed. If you turn to the next page, the bottom corner has kind of a map, and I apologize because I can only print in black and white. Um, you can see that the rate of diversions varies um, considerably across the state. And I was not able to get comparable information to say we're like a similar county or not. Um, I think um, I am told that at the Monday meeting, um, Ellen Mitchell spent an hour and a half in good discussions with the group. Um, I had emailed Rita this information last week and I failed to email her the contact information. But this might be a group who is very interested in, um, they say, they, they've gone at it from a money saving standpoint. You would have, to, diversions activities have to be funded, but they are funded typically at much less cost than housing people in jail and I just when I saw this information I felt it was important to to share it with you all. Thank, Thank you. you Karen. Good morning. morning. Joan Ratzliff Salina. Um, I wanted to follow up on what Karen said and she was, has been very interested as you might know in the jail population and uh, jail budget for years and I really appreciate her diligence and, um, and her keen eye for detail and those kinds of things. And I wish she could have been at that meeting. I was one of the, the citizens that, was, that met with Ellen and uh, she was very generous with her time and much appreciated. Um, I will say um, we citizens were not representing the ACLU and the ACLU was not present, um, but we did have this um, information uh, statistics that were provided by the ACLU that we went to her with and discussed that with her. Um, I would say that the main uh, outcome that I took from it was the problem that we have in the county um, on um, drug abuse, particularly meth, and that kind of drives everything else. So 
I want to say that's uh, a sad fact and um, and needs to be addressed somehow seriously. Um, so that aside, um, I wanted to mention um, about public access to these proceedings. Um, you know, these, this is a public meeting, obviously, and we're very fortunate to have Access TV. Um, I came a couple weeks ago, I guess, or, or maybe longer, and asked um, about possible public fishing on county property, um, and I had to leave to take care of some other business, and I was very thankful that Commissioner Shadwick asked uh, towards the end of the meeting, which I was able to see on Access TV, um, you know, and get an answer to that question. So um, there are people who would like to be able to see and hear the proceedings um, who can't be here ever, um, but we have Access TV that if it's recorded, you can see that and it helps to um, be an informed citizen and informed citizens um, I think are better and can help us govern ourselves. Um, so I want to ask that um, whenever possible that that occurs. Um, there's a lot of um, study session information both on the city and the county side that is um, taken in the room over there and, and I, I would ask that whenever possible, and I've asked this before, so I'm gonna repeat myself and other people that were here last week, um, that those be done out here whenever possible so that it can um, encourage citizen participation. So thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, keep in mind that those meetings that are held in those over there are open to the public. Oh, absolutely. They are open to the public. It's a matter of actual access though. They're not everybody can come. Thank you. All right, mm -hmm. thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the Commission for Regular Business. Item number one. Approve agenda for public forum as presented. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve the agenda for the public forum as presented. Second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we approve today's agenda for the public forum. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, motion carries. Item number two. Approval of county commission minutes for June 5th, 2018. Mr. Chairman, I move we accept the county commission minutes of June 5th, 2018 as presented. Second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we accept the county commission minutes of June the 5th, 2018. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, motion carries. Item number three. Approval of county commission minutes for June 12th, 2018. Mr. Chairman, I move we accept the county commission meetings of June 12th, 2018 as presented. Second the motion. Moved and seconded that we approve the county commission minutes of June the 12th, 2018. Those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Item number four. Approval of county commission minutes for June 13th, 2018. Mr. Chairman, I move we accept the county commission minutes of June 13th, 2018 as presented. Second the motion. <laughs> Moved and seconded that we approve uh, county commission minutes of June the 13th, 2018. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. No more minutes. Item number five. <laughs> RFA 163-18, Walmart Community Grant Program mm -hmm. with Hannah Stambaugh, Emergency Management Director. Good morning, Good Commissioners. Good morning, Hannah. Um, I am here on, the, on behalf of uh, Saline County Rural Fire District number two uh, for the request of the Board of County Commissioners to approve um, the acceptance of a Walmart Community Grant in the amount of $500. This particular grant will be used for the purchase of some safety gear. I believe that they have the intention of purchasing bunker gear with uh, some of this, with this fund. Um, the uh, grant program is uh, something that Walmart does every single year through uh, grant periods <coughs> that uh, um, support public safety programs by providing uh, dollars per use of training and or safety equipment. Um, as a special note, um, Sarah Hallbaker, who is the wife of Rural, uh, Rural Fire District Number 2, uh, Riley Hallbaker, is the one that has been working with the fire district to do these grants. Um, so she definitely is the one that gets all the kudos for doing all the paperwork and, and research and whatnot uh, for doing that. Um, there is no match requirement for this. Uh, so this uh, would just be a complete total award of $500 to Rural Fire District Number 2. Any questions of staff? Uh, Hannah, isn't this the second year they've uh, 
been awarded this? Uh, no, they were <laughs> awarded uh, a different grant through Lowe's um, okay. just a few months ago. So this is another grant opportunity for them. Is this a grant that they need to apply for? Mm -hmm. And not, we only have one fire district that applied. Is that is that how that works? Or um, no, there all the other districts can apply for it. It just kind of depends on what their needs are. Um, I know that we've also had uh, District Seven has been approved with this Walmart grant before in past years, and I know District Five has applied for other grants too that have been through other organizations. Okay. Uh, any public comment? If not, I'll bring it back to the commission for possible action. Mr. Chairman, I move we accept the Walmart community grant in the amount of $500 for Will Fire District Number 2 for training and or safety equipment. Second. Is there further discussion? It's been moved and seconded that we approve the $500 real grant for Fire District Number 2. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Move on to item number 6. Radio infrastructure discussion with Hannah Steinbaugh, Emergency Management Director. Good morning. Good morning again, Hannah. Um, I am going to invite Mr. Alan Talkington up here with me. Um, we have a presentation. Uh, this is a process that we've been going through for the last couple of months, and this is the formal presentation on the uh, needs assessment that was uh, performed by our consulting company, TUSA. So I will turn most of the discussion over to Alan, um, but myself, um, several members of our 911 Advisory Council is here, as well as several representatives from our rural fire districts um, to show the importance of this particular uh, presentation and the assessment report that was uh, provided for us. Good morning, Alan. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, I'm sorry, is this on? Yep. Oh, it is. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. My name is Alan Talkington with TUSA Consulting. Um, we were retained uh, to give a needs assessment at this point for all public safety agencies within the city and county. Um, I have a relatively short 35 slide presentation for you. Um, there is an associated report with this that is 293 pages that is in great detail um, as well. And so uh, some of the information, this is a high level information. Um, if there are any questions, by all means, please stop at any point. You don't have to wait for the end and I'm happy to answer. Um, but if there's anything in great detail that would be needed, um, I would probably reference the uh, the larger report, which of course can be shared. It's been given to uh, to Hannah and to Wayne and uh, city and county staff, so uh, that can that can of course be shared and discussed as well. But uh, I'll try to keep it on this for the sake of time. But if there are any questions, please don't hesitate to stop me. Uh, so again, my name is Alan Talking to with Tusa Consulting. This is a quick agenda of, of this presentation. Uh, some of the staff that's here has seen this. We uh, previously gave this to some key personnel, uh, fire department, uh, law enforcement personnel, and I believe some city and county staff were there as well. So what this covers, again, you will see the overview of our approach and how we took with this. Uh, we visited all of the radio infrastructure sites. Uh, we gave, uh, came and provided user interviews for fire and law enforcement and public safety agencies and also public works agencies agencies, animal control, things like that, water department, uh, as much as we could get down into the depth of the users of a, the existing radio system and any potential future radio system to understand all the, the diverse needs that all the users have and how a uh, holistic view could be taken on this approach. Um, we did what's called drive testing and that is where we had uh, test equipment mounted inside of uh, our vehicles and we drove the county. In fact, uh, Wayne Pruitt and I spent the better part of uh, two days just driving around and measuring the actual live signal strength of the system so that way we could give you maps that will show here that show the areas of the county where the system does and does not work and the different varying degrees of that. Um, we also provided you five conceptual designs with this that give you, again, five options that the uh, the joint users city county could, uh, could look at and that included budgetary numbers as well to look at. And then finally, the last piece of this will be next step that uh, that all agencies could look at taking and moving forward should they choose to. So with that, I'll jump right in. Um, just a quick overview, TUSA was established in 1992. Initially, we worked with uh, long distance microwave communication networks uh, offshore in the Gulf of Mexico, but over time, um, the system design techniques were adapted and applied to the public safety market. Uh, today, TUSA's uh, sole focus is public safety radio communications and expanded actually into 911 communications uh, as well. 
uh, and overall safety of first responders. And uh, TUSA has been recognized by Mission Critical Magazine as one of the nation's top public safety consultants. Uh, I myself live in Kansas City, so I'm not a far drive. And uh, we actually have three staff members uh, that live in Kansas City, one of which, in the Kansas City area, I should say, one of which lives in Paola and is a Kansas resident as well. So these, uh, this system uh, was of particular importance to him because being a Kansas resident, he cares very much for the state and the, the citizens of the state. Um, again, our, our overview here is a very simple three-step process, investigate, interview, and inspect. Investigate meaning gather the information that we can, documentation, look at all the user information um, that they can give us. The interviews, actually speaking to each user. E I mean, the, the firefighters can tell you we went uh, to as many stations as we possibly could, met and scheduled times to discuss this with the law enforcement officials, EMS, everybody that we could possibly meet with to get a uh, firm understanding understanding of the user's needs and wants of a system. And then finally, inspection uh, kind of covers our site visits where we went, took pictures, and gave in this detailed 293-page report um, very intricate details of the current state of your public safety communication system. And that's the inspection part of it. Um, the site visits include all these sites. Uh, I'll quickly go through them all, and uh, but th this is Everything that you have with your radio system of some degree is at one of these sites. It could be some of it's law enforcement, some of it's fire, some of it's EMS, some of it is a hybrid of all of them. Um, some of it has just passing through network connectivity. Uh, the Camp Phillips site being the primary site for rural fire, that is where the system talks out whenever they do fire paging and alerting. That's where it goes from. A lot of these other towers like Gypsum Hill, uh, Sunset Park, things like that. That is for the talk in for when the subscribers, the users are keying their radio and transmitting for dispatch and other users to hear them. Um, let's see, Markley Road site. Uh, that site has, I believe, EMS at that uh, location. Um, the New Cambria site and Muir Road site and the uh, Headville Rolling Hills Zoo site have a variety of uh, fire paging users there. Um, the Brookville White Cross is also for rural fire paging. Um, the one other point I'd make here is that Sunset Park is also a key uh, EMS user and fire user as well, or e equipment there. The East Waterwell site provides fire paging for the east side of the county. And then of course we have uh, 911 radio dispatch site and the backup dispatch site at fire station three. So again, that's a lot to say that you have an amalgamation of equipment at multiple different sites and they perform a multitude of different functions to cover public safety as a whole for the county and the city. Uh, continuing on here, we just have some pictures of some of the existing equipment here, uh, some of the, uh, the coax going up there. One of the things that I want to note on this that we noted in our report is that uh, the system is a fair, a it's an age system. Um, a lot of the equipment is getting upwards of 13 to 15 years old. Um, and so there is just um, over time, as new pieces are added, things are changed, not all of these strictest um, standards are upheld. You know, you, you add a new antenna 10 years later and not everybody follows the exact same routing method, the exact same, you know, uh, clamping to the tower sites and the, the high standards that maybe were there initially. 10 years down the road aren't there. And that's some of the pictures that we include in there is that uh, as part of any work to be done, whether the existing system is kept or a, a discussion occurs about a new system, there's probably some work that could be done to improve the, uh, the, the coax, the transmission lines, the antennas, and the overall setup of the system. Uh, the next page will come to, or the next slide will come to here, the user interviews. Uh, these you can see here, I won't uh, go through each one, but you can read and see all the different people we met with, school districts, rural fire. Uh, again, we tried to cover as many possible uh, existing users and potential users of any future system as possible so as to, again, have a complete understanding of the needs of public safety in here. As with I'm sure everybody knows with the news of school shootings and things like that, you can't overlook a school district as well. And so we wanted to, we did include them as part of these discussions. So that way there was as much holistic view as possible. Uh, we also sent out an online questionnaire 
Um, we had hundreds of responses from that. It was a great turnout from the, the county and city agencies. Um, and it, again, it, quest it proposed question things like, how old is your radio? How old is your battery? How often do you use your radio? How often do you rely on a cell phone because the radio doesn't work where you're at? Um, are you on an eight hour shift, a 10 hour, a 12 hour shift? We tried to, again, glean as much information as we can from the users of the system for the same purpose of understanding the, the total usage of the system and what it would look like currently and any future system designs. Uh, these are the three primary user needs, and this is one of the main slides that I want to get to here uh, for the commissioners. Uh, first and foremost, in any radio system, is coverage. You have to know as a user, if you're going to be in a field somewhere on the southeast side of this county or in the center of the town or wherever you may be, you will hear dispatch and dispatch will hear you. Other firefighters, other law enforcement officials, other EMTs can hear you, you can hear them. Uh, cover our saying, kind of a colloquialism in our company, is coverage is king. There's no more important aspect of this than being heard from both directions. Um, but that, of course, plays into item number two, which is reliability and performance issues. Uh, we noted that there have been times where there have been long-term outages where the system has gone off air completely or where there have been audio quality issues that had to have maintenance and things performed on it. And uh, there were long-term, and when I say long-term, I'm talking about more than a couple of hours, you know, because a public safety and 911 call can come in at any time. So if we're even talking about three, four hours, we start to consider that long-term outage or issues because, as, as you know, this is a 24-hour situation. And then, of course, the final piece of this is interoperability. And what that specifically means is not only operability is communicating within the county, interoperability is communicating outside of the county. That's the highway patrol. That's when you have other firefighting agencies that come in to support you when you have large grass fires or things like that. And conversely, when your staff is going to their counties to help them out when they have their large grass fires, structure fires, things like that. So interoperability is the third. And I, d I would say that's probably in our order of what our opinion is of importance, but we're talking 1A, 1B, and 1C. It's not that significant of a difference between the three. Interoperability is just as important for people to come in and help you and you to go help people. I'm sure being neighborly, just not only amongst yourselves, but your counties as well, is very important to the commissioners as it would be for the users of the system here. Uh, continuing on, I, it's the projector maybe doesn't show it as well, but um, this is drive testing. Uh, this is actually, as I said, what uh, Mr. Pruitt and I uh, did. We drove throughout the, I did some of it by myself. Mr. Pruitt joined me for a large portion of it as well. Um, I just drove through the county and we have this um, uh, test equipment that has been um, configured and aligned to make sure it is uh, in tune for every time that we use this. We go back and check it to make sure it's not you know, out of alignment or anything. And so as we're driving through there with this aligned equipment, this tells us in this particular map what the outdoor coverage would be. If it was a user driving around in a car and had his car radio, portable, a handheld radio, what his coverage would look like. Um, for the most part, it's okay, but there is some significant loss. It, it's Again, it's hard to tell, but down on the bottom right side, the southeast corner of the county, and generally among the southern side of the county, there is some struggles with the, the current radio system, even outdoors. On the opposite corner of that, the northwest side, there are some struggles with the existing system, even outdoors. And I'll tell you, if it's not great outdoors, it's only going to get worse as you step inside a doorway to somebody's house or a building, which you'll see here in the coming slides. Um, or I thought it, maybe that's in the presentation or the report I'm thinking. But there are other slides in the report that give each individual step of, okay, as I were to step into a home, a single story wood framed home, what would my coverage look like? If I went inside of a school, what would my coverage look like? If I went inside of a hospital, what would my coverage look like on the existing system? And that's part of the coverage maps that are provided, like I said, in that 293 page report. It tells you just an overview of what the current coverage is. What are findings you'll see here? Um, the transmitters, the repeaters uh, that we call them, the transmitters, receivers, uh, they, the the manufacturer that announced the end of life of that equipment in 2013 and actually ended maintenance on that in 2017. So any maintenance to be done on any of the equipment would have to be third party either through your current maintenance vendor having spares of that equipment or 
you know, websites like eBay, whatever else it might be, where you can find third-party equipment. I'm not saying that's the only place you can find it, but it is not supported by the manufacturer anymore. Um, the equipment is slowly degrading. Again, I mentioned that there have been times that we were told from the users that there have been outages, uh, problems where there were significant times where the radio system was not operable. Um, there was a, uh, back in 2012 to 2013 timeframe, there was a uh, FCC mandate called narrowbanding, where every radio user in the frequency band that you use uh, was required to essentially use less spectrum and had to make an update to their radios that the FCC again required to use less spectrum. And that was their effort to open more frequencies so they could sell more frequencies and get more users out there having radios. Uh, the bad side of that is that it affected coverage. Narrow banding, just because of the physics of how it works, diminishes coverage, not only outdoors, but of course as you go indoors it gets significantly worse. And so when that occurred, now coverage for the radio users that may have been sufficient before was starting to find these dead areas within the county and the city where the radios could not work. Uh, again, infrastructure issues, there are tower issues, shelters, you know, problems that we found with coax resting in grass in some places, very simple maintenance things, but that affect the long-term operation of a radio system. And then, of course, interoperability issues, as I mentioned before, there's uh, a significant difference of radio infrastructure between the states. So utilizing, um, trying to grab a radio and talk to a highway patrolman is not as easy uh, right now because they use modern digital technology that the FCC and other agencies like APCO have solidified as the national public safety radio standards. Um, and the, a lot of the equipment that's currently used within the county and the city is not compatible with that. So it makes communication between state agencies and or neighboring agencies incompatible with your equipment. Um, and then, uh, again, that's kind of touched on state agencies, neighboring counties, other people that use different radio equipment is what it touches on. Um, so the, l the last bits of this presentation uh, include conceptual designs. Um, I will try to, as you know, quickly as I can go through this, but getting the appropriate information to the commissioners. But again, this is a lot of information, so if you do have questions, please do not hesitate to stop me. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, as you'll see here, I'll give you a quick overview. The five designs, two of them cover your existing frequency band of UHF, should the, the commissioners and the, all the users choose to stay in their existing frequencies. Uh, but the final three uh, allow a transition to what is called the 800 megahertz. 800 megahertz is what the state uses for their statewide highway patrol and other counties and cities that have joined the statewide system called K6. Uh, 800 megahertz is what McPherson County has just signed a contract to move towards and other counties around you, Ellsworth County uses a significant portion of 800 megahertz. So there are users that are joining into that 800 megahertz spectrum. That doesn't preclude you from joining onto the state system. As you'll see here, uh, option four provides a standalone system that you own, maintain, and control yourself, which I'm gonna specifically touch on uh, item four here in a little bit when we get there. But uh, there's really uh, some multiple choices that we have here, and we tried to provide you with as many possible options so that way you could make an informed decision for your county and city. So with that, I'll uh, jump into this here. Um, the very first one is a UHF conventional standalone system. What that means is you use your existing frequencies, and it's designed very similar to how the existing system is. You have one repeater, and you have one group of people talking on it. So you would have a fire repeater, and a law enforcement repeater, and an EMS repeater. Now, of course, people could turn to those channels and speak to each other on the radios, but it would effectively be a dedicated channel per user. Um, the, some of the pros of that is that there is cheaper cost with that, there's less infrastructure behind it, um, and it is similar to your current operation. Some of the, the, take the drawbacks from that is that there is no redundancy in channel sharing, which we'll get to here in some of the, the future technologies, and it may require a multi-band radio, meaning if I want to, as a user, say I'm a firefighter, and I not only want to talk in my system, but I want to talk to troopers or a neighboring fire agency or some other agency, I may require a radio that is more expensive to have be able to talk on both the 800 megahertz as I referenced and your existing radio system as well. So while the infrastructure may be less on the upfront, the long-term implications of purchasing radios may be more expensive. 
Uh, again, the projector maybe doesn't show very well, but what we have here, this is what the coverage would look like portable on the street, meaning just a, a user out in the field, anywhere in the county. Uh, we specifically designed these conceptual designs to have at a minimum 95% coverage within the county. So if you went and ch chopped the county into a bunch of little squares, 5% uh, of them would be the minimum that it could be accepted to not have coverage. And so with this, I believe we reached uh, outdoor coverage 99%, but just as we go along with this, understand that our standard is that 95% of the county at a minimum would be covered. So we would not consider it an acceptable solution if it was less than that. So all five of these meet that basic minimum. This one again, outdoor, portable on the street would have upwards of 99% coverage everywhere they go in the county. Uh, the next map you'll see here, this is what we call a 6 dB house. And what that means in layman's terms is that if you were to step into a standard single story wood or metal framed house, your standard house in the county, on average you will lose what's called 6 decibels or 6 dB of signal strength from the tower sites. And so this allows you a good coverage map to show you if an officer, a firefighter, an EMT walked into a house anywhere in the county, would it work or would it not work? Again, conceptual design solution, but this is a map that you will look at and see. There is a capability with the, uh, the locations, tower site things that you have now, if designed appropriately, to give you coverage. In this case, I this one reaches 95% of coverage walking into a house within the county. Um, the last one that you'll see here, this is a portable 20 dB. Now, this is where we start to get into significant buildings. That means 20 decibels of signal have been lost from the tower site. This is in uh, layman's terms equivalent to what we consider a hospital, a large school, a very thick wall building. In fact, the public safety building, stone, rebar, concrete, things like that. That's generally wh where you will see significant loss. This is a map to show you that with uh, a projected design like this, you could significantly expand the large buildings within your county that you have reached into. Uh, specifically, one of the ones we spoke to, uh, there's a, I'm sorry, what's the name of the school that's on the southeast side, just outside of town that we... South East South, okay, yeah, and so uh, that was, for the schools, that was a big point of, uh, of note that they wanted to make because in the current system, there's significant drawbacks to the radio coverage inside of there, and so if law enforcement officers, EMTs, firefighters try to go assist in there, there's essentially no radios once you step through the door. And so part of these conceptual design solutions are to cover um, your key buildings. And in fact, uh, Mr. Pruitt and Ms. Stanball, they gave us a list of key buildings that we had to include as part of this to make sure that they were covered with any conceptual design. So there's, a, I believe, 20 or 30, uh, maybe even more buildings that we have. There, there li we have a list of them in the report <coughs> that uh, are all, you know, it's the Phillips lighting, it's the churches, it's all the schools, the numerous schools that are in the county grain elevators, all of the significant buildings that are part of the, the Tony's Pizza Center or uh, the, I forget the name has changed, but uh, the, the Vince Center is here as well. Um, so that, that completes that first one. That is a very simple solution. It is operating similar to how you have right now. The next solution is slightly different in what's called a trunking. The unique difference between trunking and conventional that you'll see if you look at the headers between the two, a trunking system allows a repurpose of a channel. So let's say normally on a conventional uh, system I have three channels. I have law, fire, and EMS. That channel one is always law, channel two is always fire, and channel three is EMS, just as an example. I'm not saying it has to be that way. In a trunking system, it's a shared usage. Channel one can be handed off to be both fire, law, and EMS. It can be shared with any number of users. It doesn't always have to be a law channel. It doesn't always have to be a fire channel. It doesn't always have to be an EMS channel. So the, the one of the big pros with a trunk system like this is that you become efficient with your frequencies. So now, if you have a channel go down, in the conventional system, if the law channel goes down, law is out of operation. They have to move somewhere else or use some other system. In a trunking system, if the channel one goes down, as soon as that law officer keys up, it automatically assigns them to another open channel. So one of the key technological aspects of a trunking system is like telephones. Telephones just pick the open line. What, you have a, 
group of lines going out, when you pick up and get dial tone, it's just picking whatever open line is there. So too does this work. In fact, the trunking term comes from the telephone company history. And so it's, uh, it's an efficient use of your spectrum and it allows for maintenance, maintenance issues. If there is some sort of an antenna that gets struck by lightning or a power outage on a specific channel, you can turn that channel off and there's no effective loss to the users. They just move to the next channel and keep working seamlessly and have no idea that it's down. Um, and, and to that point, it reduces single points of failure. <coughs> if a single channel goes down, again, they move right to the next one. Some of the drawbacks, though, there is slightly higher cost because there have to be what we call the air traffic controller. It's the infrastructure behind it that tells it and picks which channel is open, which one is free for that law or fire or EMS user to use. So, of course, there is some servers and some equipment behind it that control and do the, the directing of traffic. And uh, still with this, because we stayed in the same frequency band, we still require uh, a high usage for multi-band radios because the frequencies didn't change. Yes, it's directing traffic now to pick open channels, but because you would be on a different frequency band than a lot of your neighbors, including the state, it may require the more expensive multi-band radios to use. Um, moving into the coverage, uh, the coverage looks almost identical to the other map that I showed you because, again, it's the same frequency, same towers. It's just a matter of making efficient use of those channels rather than each channel being dedicated. So um, I won't waste time going into it, but I will tell you that if you look at this, the mathematics show that it's nearly identical between the two. So there's no significant difference on the two from the conventional versus trunking. Okay. Yes, go ahead, oh, sir. That's a lot of information. Well, just a quick question here is yeah. like on that trunking type of system there, if you had an emergency with a, like a tornado or, or something that comes in, mm -hmm. does a trunking, is it possible that those trunks could get full and nobody could use those, y y you'd lose users? I, yeah, so, uh, well, uh, you wouldn't lose users, okay. and that's actually a great point. So let me give you another point of difference between the two channels. If a, on a conventional system, if somebody's talking on that channel and it gets busy, or say, for example, you have a tornado roll through and everybody's using their channel, if somebody's trying to get on that channel, you got to wait till someone stops talking or, get, you know, wait till it clears up, which I don't know if you guys know, but a tornado, that essentially doesn't happen. <laughs> and uh, so on a trunk system, they actually have a channel that is constantly listening for users trying to get in the system. And it actually has busy queuing that can go on. So if the channels are busy and, it's, and somebody's trying to get in, it actually can be built to, as soon as a channel is open, to send a signal back to that user to say, user, your radio channel is now free, please keep, and give them the opportunity, 10 seconds, 15, 30 seconds, whatever can be pre-programmed in the system, say you were waiting for a channel, you were in my queue to use it, go ahead and key up, go ahead and start using your channel. So you don't have to wait for someone to stop talking, you can just key up, get the busy signal, and say, okay, I can jump into it now. So to your point, okay. it, it, it can give you some queuing okay. with that. All right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, ex that. absolutely. Okay. I, this is a lot of information. So again, please stop me if you have any questions. The this key difference now, though, is on these next three options, we're moving into a different frequency band. So the first two use your same frequencies. The next three transition to what is 800 megahertz. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Yes, so for example, you could let, let's just say, for example, you had four channels that were available. You could set, say, the law channel or the law group of communication, the fire and EMS as the priority. And if it is, uh, I don't want to demean anybody, so this is, let, let's just say you had a user that was deemed by the county and the city as a lower priority, uh, then yes, you could set certain channels to have a higher priority to gain access to the system as well. So yes, absolutely. That's a good question, sir. Thank you. Uh, so 800 megahertz that will be referenced in the next three pr um, proposal or, uh, designs, this moves to the same frequency band that your neighbors are using. The state uses 800 megahertz, McPherson, Ellsworth significantly uses it, and others are as well. Um, so this is a very dedicated and well-maintained frequency band by the FCC. And again, users around you are using it. Excuse me. Some of the pros, again, trunk system, sharing of channels, provides, uh, reduces single points of failure. Now, in that third bullet point, you'll notice there's interoperability with the state surrounding counties. You're now using radios that operate on the same frequencies as your neighbors do. Um, <coughs> and because of that, now, as you saw on the first two points, where there was a necessity to buy radios that could talk on both frequency bands, now you can look at options for less expensive radios because you only need to buy a radio that has one frequency band. Everybody is on the 800, so therefore you only have to buy 800 megahertz radios. 
Um, and there are some reduced maintenance costs as well. This particular option that I'm showing you here is about joining the state system. Should the city, county, and everyone choose to join the state system, this is some of what would be an option for that. There are reduced maintenance costs because the air traffic control equipment I was mentioning to you, the state already owns that. So you would be tying into it, which luck for you is exists in Saline County. <laughs> Salina is one of their main sites, so you don't have to tie clear to Topeka to take access to this. It's here in your backyard. <laughs> Most people don't have that luxury. You. That's one of the reasons why you have five options is because that luxury exists to Salina and Saline County here. Uh, but that also reduces cost because you don't have to pay for the air traffic controller, the servers, the back end infrastructure that controls a lot of that. The state already does. You're just buying, in this case, tower sites to give you the coverage that you need. Some of the cons of the drawbacks, this is a state controlled system, so you are at the whim of the state. Now, with that, uh, we actually had a conference call this morning. Uh, Mr. Buxton, Mr. Pruitt, uh, Ms. Stambaugh were on that call with myself and another consultant from Tusa who was not locally here but was on a conference call. And we asked some questions of him and we wanted to, again, be educated for the commissioners to give as much information as possible. Um, I don't know if you want to touch on some of that, but uh, basically the long and the short of it is they want to welcome people in. They are very open for other users joining onto the system. There are, in fact, many cities and counties throughout the state that have joined, the most recent being by Kansas City, Franklin County, but there are some around here that have joined onto the state system as well. Um, but with that, uh, their mindset, you know, we have to look at it from a state perspective versus just a county perspective. They're not just worried about Saline County. They're worried about the whole state and, and its maintenance. So there's some difference, you know, possibly on what priority is to them versus what priority is to Saline County. And, of course, they control it. If they make a decision, they don't necessarily have to, you know, consult with Saline County. They generally do consult with their partner agencies, but there's no mandate to do that. So, but... There, again, there's pros and cons to each side, reduced maintenance costs, less control of the system. Um, and then the final point, just as a quick point, not all of the sites have microwave connectivity. Why we put that on here, Tusa's opinion is that, again, we have a background in microwave, is using wireless links from site to site that you own, you maintain, and you control is the optimal path for the county, in our opinion. However, there are other options, leasing lines from AT&T, uh, CenturyLink as well obviously has a large play within the state of Kansas. So there are other options as well besides that. And because of that, again, you are at the whim of AT&T's maintenance schedule, maintenance cycle, if they have outages, things like that. So not all of the, the case <coughs> excuse me, KASIC sites use microwave. And so therefore, that's another layer of uh, risk that's added into this. So moving on from the pros and cons here. Um, one of the points we want to show you, these are the tower sites uh, that exist within the state. And again, much to your <laughs> luck, you are pretty well surrounded by tower sites. Uh, McPherson, Dickinson, uh, Ottawa, Rice, Ellsworth all have tower sites. And in fact, so much so that in our uh, design, we actually were able to remove one whole tower site from the need for the county and city to, to build and maintain because there was such a good surrounding coverage. In fact, the Burlington, uh, Bennington, excuse me, Bennington site in Ottawa County covers the north side of the county extremely well because it's right at the county border. So we didn't need a site there that you'll see in some of the other designs where it's a standalone system because of that. Uh, again, the color, is the contrast isn't great, but... Uh, the whole county's covered. I mean, it's all nearly 100% coverage because not only can you utilize the sites you build, you can utilize the sites of the surrounding counties. Uh, that is, again, an option with this. Uh, again, portable in-house, significant coverage inside. Um, but again, uh, pros and cons with this, giving up control, things like that. And then, of course, in building coverage, you'll see the Ottawa, because it's within the map here, the Ottawa site is right on the north side of the county line. Dickinson, if you look on the right side of the map, there's that red on the right side. That's very close to Dickinson. And then, of course, McPherson is slightly northeast of the city of McPherson. So uh, that, that's, again, you'll have some, some coverage assistance into the southern side of the county using the state system. Any questions on the state system so far? All right, uh, moving on. This is the option that uh, I'll probably come back to most heavily. This is the DIY option. This is the uh, county and city owns, operates, maintains. And why I 
uh, focus on this system is as we talk about future movement of a possible <coughs> RFP that could occur to design the system, this is the most apples to apples comparison. This is nobody gets to use other, the Motorola uh, maintains the state system, so Motorola can't try to leverage the state system. The McPherson County system, which I'll get to after this one, is uh, uh, the vendor is Motorola's competitor, Harris. So they could try to leverage some of their existing contractual agreements with McPherson to help in here. The problem is, is that it becomes a non-apples to apples comparison on quotes. And so uh, I'll come back to that here in the next steps at the end, but that's a specific reason why I focus on this, is that this option is the true owned and maintained by the city, county, whatever the joint uh, effectiveness would be of this, that uh, it truly gives any responding vendors that will try to give you a proposal an apples to apples comparison to make sure that you're getting what you're asking for. So again, getting into this, the pro, uh, I'm sorry, did I see a question back here? No? Okay, well I thought I saw him. We're not going to be yeah. open to public Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Right. I apologize. We're keeping this in the commission, so. Okay, I apologize. My apologies. Um, so with the uh, pros on this, again, trunked system sharing a channel, very much similar to the last systems where there's uh, reduced points of failure because of channel sharing. If a channel goes down, it just assigns the next one to it. Um, because it's on the 800 megahertz uh, band still, there provide uh, there's interoperability that's provided between the county, the city, and other agencies surrounding you. Uh, again, cheaper radios or less expensive radios because now you can buy ones that just have a single band in them. You don't have to buy the more expensive multi-band options. And now in this option, it is direct control. You di dictate, you maintain it, you get to decide how it's used, who uses it. Um, and I will tell you that there is significant interest in Saline County and Saline and what you're doing, specifically from Highway Patrol. As you saw a few, um, slides back, there is no tower for the highway patrol system in Salina, Kansas, where the highway patrol headquarters is at. They are using the coverage of the surrounding counties into it. So, of course, a lot of the troopers are very interested to hear and see what the future may bring from Salina and Saline County because multiple different options could provide multiple different solutions to assist them as well. Again, getting back to the point of, if, you know, assuming how neighborly you are with all the different agencies around here. Uh, some of the cons, of course, because it is all on you, there are increased maintenance costs and uh, purchase costs on this. The, the air traffic controller piece I was talking about, all the tower sites, you would need additional tower site for this because now you're not using the K6 system so that Bennington sis, uh, site that's in Ottawa is not a part of this because that's part of the state system. This is your own system. So there would be, in this case, the New Cambria site, which is near the city of New Cambria up there, uh, would be included to cover the north side of the county on this. So there would be four tower sites versus the three with the, uh, the K6 system. So again, cost difference. Quick question here. Yeah. Is, is going to this option, these options here, since you're still on the 800 megahertz, I mean, does it then still operate with the highway patrol, all these other frequencies that they're on? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that, uh, and again, this is, is getting into the weeds a little bit, so apologies on that, but in the 293 page report that you'll see, there's a functionality called ISSI. And what that is in layman's terms, that is taking multiple <coughs> standard P25 digital systems and tying them together. And so if they're the same frequency, assuming you come to some sort of an MOU or an MOA or whatever, it may be a legal agreement with the state, with McPherson, with whomever you may want, um, the users could roam from system to system. So even if you build your <coughs> own system, a highway patrolman could take uh, uh, his radio, his or her radio, and as they come down the interstate or wherever, could roam to your site. So even though you build it, you maintain it, you could offer the use of some of your capacity to neighboring agencies to use through here. So. Uh, and because it's on the same frequency band, they don't have to buy new radios. They don't have to, they just have to reprogram their radios to use your towers. Okay. Does that answer your question, yes. sir? Yes, thank you. Okay, absolutely. Um, so going on to the next one here. The, uh, the one thing to note here, because this is not on K6, again, you cannot take advantage of the coverage of those neighboring sites, but the pro being now you control it and have more direct say of what happens here. Um, this still provides 95% portable on the street, which is again our standard of operation. We won't accept anything less for on the street usage. Um, this actually has upwards, I believe, of 93 or 94, 93% uh, I believe, within the county for uh, our 60B, again, single story wood frame and or steel or metal framed housing. Uh, the one significant place that you'll start noticing some loss on is what we call the gypsum valley. I mean, you may call that too. That's what I refer to it as. And that is the, uh, on the extreme east side of the county going from the city of gypsum north, that is a topographic dip. And uh, so therefore it causes some, some signal issues, but 
to compensate with that, part of this design is putting a tower in the city of Gypsum. And so as, again, a conceptual design, if you pull that tower out, the whole east side of the county becomes a whole lot less covered. And so to meet, again, these 95 and certain percentage coverage requirements that we had and were assigned to us also from the, the county, the city, and the joint agencies, a tower was needed there to cover that whole eastern side of the county because, it, again, is a just a – I don't know who says Kansas is flat because I can tell you that is not the case. <laughs> um, again, with portable 20 dB, uh, this is, again, your schools, your hospitals, your large, thick – free bar or concrete stone buildings, it still provides significant coverage, specifically within the city limits, and also to significant buildings, the key important buildings throughout the county and the city. Uh, the final option here, we're getting to the end of this, and I apologize, I hope I'm not taking too much of your time here, uh, but I want it, this is important, I think, to share as many options as we can with the commissioners here. Uh, this is an option that has been presented as well. As I mentioned, uh, we, we are the consultants also for McPherson County. Uh, they joined into an agreement with a company called Harris. Uh, you may know them for making the military radios. I was a Marine, and I used a heck of a lot of radios with Harris. Um, and so um, they have offered kindly, and uh, Hannah has spoken with their 9-1 director, that should a desire be there, they've actually given written consent to the county and city to enter into discussions with them uh, if you would like to explore an option of joining into their already, they have not started anything. They only signed the contract last month, I think it was. And so there's been no construction, nothing going on with it yet. So it's still very early stages that should the city of Salina and the county of Saline County want to look into, they would be happy to share some of their resources with you and create a joint system which similar to the K6, they already they bought, they're paying for the, the air traffic controller. That's already in their contract. So those are some of the reduced costs that could be uh, gathered from Saline County and the city of Salina is that since they've already agreed to pay for it, you m may not have to pay for one at all or split some of the costs. There's a, just a cost savings that could be negotiated between Saline County, city of Salina, and McPherson County. Um, very similar. Um, basically all the same pros and cons, reduced single points of failure, interoperability, because same frequency band. The one main con being, um, at this point, we have to, we, I can't make any assumptions as to what McPherson would let Saline County use. So they have said they would let you control your own radios, of course, and if you buy new radios, add them in. But until negotiations occur, there's been no promises or anything made of, yeah, we'll share some of our hardware with you and we'll, if we have two servers, we'll split it and give you one and we'll keep one. I think that uh, in Tusa's opinion, that option is there for discussion. I think they would be amenable to that discussion, but at this point, <coughs> no negotiation. So we have to assume worst case scenario being that they control the system. They're the ones that have signed the contract. So should you do that, worst case scenario is like K6, they control the system. Now, if you're friendly with them, then that's probably not going to be a problem, but those are some of the things that would occur in negotiations with them. Uh, very similar design. It would have all the same four towers. Um, we have one in the city of Salina. Again, the, um, the, the I'm sorry, I'm blanking out here. Ca um, New Cambria on the north side, uh, the gypsum, uh, city of gypsum to cover that east side. So it's the same towers as the, the previous system where it's the standalone. Basically, the big key differences here is instead of being standalone real everything, you now allow the cost to be shared with McPherson and you don't have to have the servers and the back end control. Similar in-house coverage and similar portable DB. Again, same tower sites. The coverage is identical um, between the standalone or this. It's just the cost savings done with the back-end infrastructure. Okay, so that brings me to my final slide here. Uh, I believe my final slide of next steps. Uh, in Tusa's opinion, uh, the next steps are for city county officials to uh, sit down, discuss, decide what the best options are. I know some of those discussions have already been occurring to some degree and will continue to occur for some period. And then once the, uh, the options are identified to develop an RFP uh, specification. In TUSA's professional opinion, providing for the city and the county, option four is the best option, our opinion, for writing an RFP. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, writing an RFP can also provide, um, can be written as such to say you must provide a proposal for the apples to apples comparison, but if you as a vendor have a unique option that you would like to provide for the city and the county, 
one being joining McPherson on one vendor and the other vendor possibly joining the state system, uh, that an RFP can be written to open up such an option to give a secondary proposal. But our opinion is a true apples to apples. That way nobody is making promises that the other can't keep. It all meets with industry standards. Everybody makes a comparison. And then should they offer a secondary option that you would like to explore, well, that is certainly within your purview to do so. And uh, yes, questions uh, from the commissioners. Well, obviously, uh, this is a lot of a lot of it information, is. It and is. it's pretty overwhelming to me at this point in time. And I'm going to need some some time to to uh, devote, you know, get all this filtering through my mind. Uh, Hannah, uh, obviously, we're going to rely on you and your staff to put in a lot of homework here and give us some guidance. Uh, I, my question would be, I um, mean, is is the city uh, involved in this? I presume. Absolutely. And um, you've had meetings already, and? Yes, we do have representation from uh, the city, um, as well as a lot of our different uh, responder agencies that we've had these discussions. Like Alan said, this has been a, a very large process in really gathering what it is that our users of our current system really need um, to, to make a, a holistic, successful. What, what type of a time frame are we looking at here that we're going to need to get moving uh, uh, past this point and say, yes, let's go with this part or this this plan or whatever. What are, what are we talking about? Well, I, there's definitely some conversations from the financial aspect that are going to have to occur. Um, and uh, as, well as, the <laughs> 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 as well as the agreements between, you know, what the, what the city and the county um, have desired. Um, we did provide a, a basically a synopsis of the 293 page report um, that would, that outlines the, the, the pros and cons, each of the different uh, <laughs> solutions, as well as some ideas to is what other counties have done. We are not the only county in Kansas that are going, well actually we're not the only county in the whole United States that are going through these same issues and these same problems that were caused by narrow banding or just with the age of our current infrastructure. We're, we're not alone. So that is a very, uh, it's been very good to have some, some very good fluid conversations with some of our other uh, agencies as to how, how they went through the process. How did they do it? How did they pay for it? Um, those are some things that we're definitely gonna have to have some more conversations. Um, what I would say as far as the timeline is concerned, um, if we start moving towards uh, the actual building of an RFP, that's probably going to take about a good six months. After that, then um, the actual build out of a new system is going to take us anywhere from 18 to 24 months. So we've got a little while, obviously. Um, the sooner that we can work towards that RFP process, the sooner we can work towards a build out of the system. Um, but there's some questions and conversations that need to happen here within the next couple of months to really give myself and the rest of the staff and the rest of our um, public safety agencies direction as to where it is that, that we need to be going. Okay, and, and then this time, uh, I don't want to short cut off the, uh, the public, but we're not ready for questions, I don't think, at this stage of the game. From, from our, this will still have to come to a vote. Uh, there will be uh, quite a few more meetings where we will involve the public, but I don't think today is the day to get that going. Uh, but no, I, I would ask Commissioner, I mean, we do have several of our, um, our public safety agencies here, um, and this is just, it, it's a true testament to show that how much support we have um, and the great need for um, something to be done, um, as well as you know our representatives from the city that are here too. So I don't know if any of those folks have any type of comments um, that they would like to share with you um, to just reiterate the importance of, of looking and moving forward. You know, we're, we're well aware of the importance, <laughs> I can assure you that. <laughs> and uh, I do appreciate ev everyone that takes their time to come to this for this specific reason. Uh, thank you and thank you for working with Hannah and the emergency preparedness in getting getting a proposal put together and identifying our needs. So we do thank you for that. But I, 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 I would since I, I would, however, Commissioner or Ch Mr. Chair, say we do have a couple city commissioners here, mm -hmm. and if they have questions, I wouldn't mind hearing. I mean, since this is going to be a joint, this is really kind of a it joint, joint meeting plan, here, and so I wouldn't mind hearing from some of the commissioners if they have some questions. Okay. Is there anyone from the city wish to speak? <laughs> Joe Hay, uh, all I want to find out is when can we have a copy of the report so we can take a look at it so we can start studying it too. I know you guys have seen the report. 
as soon as we get back to my office, um, actually the link has been sent to Mr. Gage, um, uh, so we will make sure uh, we will take the, uh, the consultant's report has been in draft form uh, this entire time. Uh, we were waiting until an open public meeting and the draft words will be taken out and that information will be uh, presented to you, not only the 293 page report, but also the nine page synopsis <laughs> to help with that. And will that be open, uh, that's open to the public also? Yep, we'll put it on our website and Kay. get that information out that people can review it. Cool. Couple, qu a couple questions, um, and what conversations, I know that you've worked well with the city staff and, and, and all that, but have there been any conversations with the Highway Patrol or the state? Yes. About, so about the need assessments and what they would like to see us do? Yes and no. Um, we've had more conversation, just as Alan had said, we had a conference call uh, first thing this morning with um, KDOT, who, is, who runs basically the, the state system. Um, there has been some side conversations with the highway patrolmen that work in our county, and obviously they would like to see some more interoperability um, between the city and the county and the uh, sheriff's office and police department and the highway patrol. Um, that is a very attractive piece to all agencies when we're talking public safety. Um, so, uh, the, but the conversations more along the lines have been whether or not what the process is would be to make an agreement with the state um, and not necessarily what the state would want to see from us. From us, yeah. okay. Um, uh, Go ahead, Lonnie. Sorry. Um, I, I would just say in the in the large report that you're going to pass along to Mr. Gage and pass along to us, is, are there any cost figures in any of this at this point? Is that too preliminary or what? No. Uh, there are cost estimates. Uh, so the way that um, – do you want to sure. explain that part? In fact, that's part what I was going to say. So all five of our um, – perspective designs or conceptual designs each have their own cost analysis and it actually breaks it down in great detail um, how to the subscribers how many radios what tier of radios as I mentioned on the, uh, the conceptual designs that stay in your existing frequencies you'd have to buy a higher tier radio that has the multi-band mm -hmm. to communicate with them so that cost is reflected in there how many tower sites are needed if they need new buildings new generators HVAC we we tried to go into as great detail as possible so you'll actually see three main spreadsheets for each uh, conceptual design, you will see an overview that gives you uh, the holistic view of a purchase of a system. You will see the subscribers. We also included budgetary numbers for 15 years of maintenance. So when you look at this, you're going to see what it should cost you relatively for 15 years to own and operate. I mean, that's essentially the age that your existing system has ran for. Um, and, and as a point I made to uh, the, the group this morning that I would make to the commissioners as well, uh, our numbers that we're coming up with are actually, again, we have McPherson that we've done recently. We're a nationwide company, and we're actually taking proposals from these vendors across the entire nation and using them to compare against each other. So why that benefits you is because we can see many times where certain discounts are provided, say, in Atlanta or in Nashville or something like that that are just my projects, then can ask why they're not being offered in, you know, Salina, Kansas. So these cost analysis that we provided in this report come from live operational <laughs> systems that have been quoted within the last one or two years, I mean, very recent systems. So we're not trying to use estimates from 15-year-old systems. These are quotes from Motorola, from Harris, from the vendors that are recent. Um, from a financial standpoint, are there any federal funds available, grants, uh, that, or is this all going to fall on Saline County? Well, this is what I will tell you, and um, that is one of the things that we did ask the consulting company to uh, help us with researching. Uh, the closest that we could possibly come to is an assistance to firefighters grant, but that is only for firefighters. Um, and to be honest, that is a nationally competitive grant um, that hasn't been awarded too terribly much for communication systems. Okay. Well, I'll warn the public then, get ready. <laughs> uh, commissioners, if there's one other thing that I can add, in fact, I was just at NINA, which is the National Emergency Number Association, uh, one of the other, and we've mentioned this in our, our meeting before, that uh, uh, organization that gives out grants locally is oil pipelines. Uh, I, had, I have no idea if there are any oil pipelines near uh, Salina or Saline County, but they often, because the law enforcement, EMT, firefighters are assisting them when there are accidents, things like that, so many of the major oil pipeline companies are offering public safety grants for infrastructure because you're helping them out. Well, we've been aware of this uh, cost estimate for quite some time now, but to actually see it in paper and come to the meeting and present it is pretty overwhelming for me. Uh, further questions from, from the staff, from the commissioners? What mandates 
are in place that this has to happen. I mean, I can assume some counties in western Kansas wouldn't be able to do this, so I mean. This is what I will tell you, is there's, there's the, the mandates piece of it really relies more on the narrow banding piece, and that is what completely demolished our existing infrastructure when we were forced to narrow band back in 2012. Uh, there has been talk on the FCC realm of requiring for narrow banding again, and I will tell you that a good 80% of the infrastructure that we have will not survive another round of narrow banding. So um, they have not announced any type of date whatsoever to, to require that, but that's not to say they couldn't make that announcement tomorrow and they say in three years you have to narrow band again. Um, and again, we would run into the same issue that even if we stayed with right exactly where we are at, we, we just would not have the capacity to do that. Personally, I don't see how we can compromise uh, public safety, uh, and that's what this is all about. So uh, I it's not a matter of uh, what we're going to spend. It's going to be a matter of which plan we're going to have to adopt, and uh, uh, they're all comparably priced. So uh, we're going to have to roll up our sleeves and go to work on this one. So. All right, any further questions? Anna, what's the logistics of the plan forward? I mean, it's, it's conceptual. We, I mean, it's all been in the 911 uh, 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 arena so far, all the, but at some point it's got to bring all these agencies, the city, the county, everyone together and see, okay, what are we willing to do and, and what, what's our buy-in? I mean, where do we go from here? on that a little bit? You can certainly, sure. and then <laughs> no, sure. we'll rely on my 911 partners too. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, frankly, once a decision, uh, you know, we have to come to a decision, or the agencies have to, excuse me, come to a decision on the path moving forward, taking the conceptual designs and discussing internally about do you want to own it outright? Do you want to partner, say, with McPherson, with the state, whatever option you want to move forward with? Um, at that point, it would be moving into writing an RFP. Uh, again, our professional opinion is to make it an apples to apples comparison, but giving them the option to give unique proposals. That way you know that the pricing that you receive is comparable to what each of them offer. Um, and then from that point, again, Hannah had mentioned that's about a six month process for writing, releasing, you know, and then some time given for them to respond to it. But th that's probably the immediate next step is to, uh, for all the agencies to sit down, come together, decide on the, the path moving forward of which way they want to go, owning it, sharing it, uh, and then writing the RFP to, uh, to get proposals. As far as when that will happen, um, again, I think there's a lot of conversations that still need to happen jointly uh, between our different um, um, elected officials um, and the financing piece of it to really decide, you know, well, what we need to be looking for to how are we going to pay for this? Um, on top of that, what is it that we that we need? Mr. Chair, to go further with uh, Commissioner Weiss's comments. Um, um, and maybe this question is to Jason or Rita. I mean, what is the next step of us getting together? Jason, if, I mean, <laughs> she's talking, she's alluding to us having to get together to make <laughs> some decisions and, and I'm, I'm with the chair that this is so overwhelming right now. I'm not sitting here willing to, but uh, yeah. are we talking a month from now or uh, what, uh, what are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, uh, Jason Gage, city manager, <coughs> city of Salina. Very good question. We've already started talking about that. I think uh, when you look at, what, at these plans, it is, it's a, all the concepts are comprehensive. Uh, so you're looking at, for the most part, a brand new system throughout uh, the county and in the city um, that, as you, as you know, there's a pretty large price tag to that as well. So I think we need to look, at the staff probably needs to spend some time, uh, as Hannah mentioned, looking at the, what we would recommend uh, jointly as the best approach and then work from there because you're talking about 800 megahertz or not and the narrow banding and all those facets. Um, also, I think we need to look down deep into the cost estimates and see what choices there may be there. I think there are some choices. There's quality choices and other choices. I think that's a big, uh, big thing as well. And quite honestly, uh, make some calls to some other uh, agencies that have gone through this, see what they've learned and see what we can learn from that ahead of time and help uh, allow them to help us with our choices. Once we get to that point, uh, and that shouldn't take that long, it'll be over the next few weeks probably. Uh, a couple, three months. I'll look at Hannah on, on there. I don't want to, I'm not trying to add to her <laughs> calendar or schedule. But it'll take a little bit of time for us to do that, but it's not a long-term a long issue. And then hopefully be in a, a better uh, uh, 
position to come back to, to you and to the city commission and have those conversations about what those choices might be and so that you know what your choices are. And then uh, uh, provide advice, get your perspective, and then start thinking about what the cost, any net cost might be, if there's a cost change, the timelines, very important, how it's funded, the allocation of funding, all those things. Those are all pieces as well. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jason. <coughs> All right, uh, that concludes, uh, I think, what we're looking at initially, and uh, we'll get we this narrowed down to. We've got some reading. We got, oh boy. <laughs> thank you for your time. All right, thank you thank for your you. time. Thank you. Also. thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to item number seven. The Kenwood Park Plan presentation with Jason Gage, City of Salina Manager. Good morning, Jason. Uh, if you, if you want to sit at this table, you're welcome to, if that better serves your your purpose. Uh, I'm, I'm fine here. Thank you. Uh, first, first, let me just say that uh, I, I want to thank uh, the city staff, the, the city commission, the mayor, uh, all of you uh, that are coming to this meeting to, to engage us in this uh, conversation regarding the Kenwood Park uh, plan presentation and the Expo Center in general. Uh, it, it truly is a community-wide uh, effort. And uh, we appreciate you guys coming and, uh, and, and meeting us face-to-face uh, -face with this. So thank you. With that having been said, uh, I'll get off the microphone. <laughs> Turn it over to you. Thank you once again. They're changing over the presentation, so I might provide a little filler. And if they tell us it's really hard, we might ask you to take a short break. But uh, hopefully we won't have to do that. Uh, we appreciate it as well. As, uh, as you know and, and the city commissioners know, the uh, Kenwood Park, is uh, a kind of a, it's a shared area that's been shared for a long, long time. So it's a big deal to a lot of people, uh, not just the county commission and city commission, but the fair board, the citizens, everybody from the area. And we recognize that and recognize there's a sensitivity to that and any change uh, that may occur with regards to that. Uh, we also appreciate all the participation that, that you guys have put into this. And, and we know we've had some very good positive conversations about this. Uh, uh, this park and what the future holds, and we appreciate the participation of fair board members and other interested parties along the way. I think that's really important as we think about, even from our perspective, uh, you know, what would be the best use of the park and what types of improvements. Um, I, I see the uh, computer screens coming up, so we're getting closer. Uh, one, uh, I'll kind of introduce where we're coming from. What you'll see here, uh, you'll see really two presentations. I'll keep my portion pretty short. Mine's the boring narrative part that deals with the lease aspects uh, from, a, from a, a, a pretty high conceptual perspective. We don't, I won't get into tremendous detail. And then what I will do is I'll transition over to uh, Eric Dove with HDR Engineering, who we've uh, uh, brought on to help us with the, I'll say, the, the pictures and the planning and the park use questions, improvement questions. And Eric will go through that and uh, help us with that. And uh, what we'd like to do is if we can go through those things and then uh, take your questions afterwards. Uh, we think you'll have quite a few questions. Our hope is, is that after today, we can <coughs> see how closely we match or don't match. And there's always a possibility we may not match on a few things, and we know that. But on the big issues, if we can get to where we have some conceptual agreement on the big issues and we know we can work out the, uh, the detail. So uh, I don't think you'll see any tremendously big surprises from our conversations, but you'll see things that I'm sure will raise questions and we want to try to answer those and recognize, as you do as well, we're still in a negotiation and you did your part already. You have your proposal out and we wanted to take a look at that, incorporate those pieces and then uh, provide ours and then at that point is trying to bring them together the best that we can. So when we uh, put this together, we tried to take all those things in mind to take your proposal, input, our thoughts about uh, park from a park master planning, from a Smoky Hill River renewal, all those things into this. So you're going to see a lot of those pieces as part of this presentation. And again, we're very thankful for the opportunity and uh, we're excited to be working with, with you uh, with this project. Seems to be a county city themed week, but that's okay. That's a good thing. So I'll get right to it. Ooh, I think we just lost our video on that. There, it's coming back. Let me go ahead and uh, the video can catch up. Um, the first thing I'll talk about, get right to the meat of it, is the lease term. And right now, we are proposing the lease term initially be for 25 years. Now, it can have, it can have uh, whatever language to uh, extend it, uh, but starting at 25 years. 
that's based a little bit on prior conversation I think you've had, and it is negotiable. Uh, so if you feel like that's not sufficient and we want to talk about that, we can talk about every aspect of this. So please keep that in mind. I was just going to ask if we could maybe flip off another row of lights. It might help a little bit with the the picture quality up there. It's a good question. I, I don't know if we can do that very easily. There we go. Martha's gonna Martha's gonna try. Thank you. Well, we seem to still have a little technical difficulty. I'm going to keep going. Mine's more narrative based anyway. <laughs> um, so the lease term initially 25 years subject to negotiation and also uh, to uh, various renewal terms. We're not getting that. We're trying to stay at a, at a high level at this point and see how we match up. Lease effective date, we're, we're really optimistic and think that we can, if we can come to terms, we would like the lease effective date to be sometime between the time that the, the fair is completed this year and the, end, and the end of the year. We think that fits because why do anything that would disrupt this fair? There's, we don't want to do that. Um, the park use uh, uh, is proposed to be, for the most part, the same that's included in the current 2009 Kenwood Park lease, uh, with the exception of the location for the Tri-Rivers Fair Outdoor Rodeo Arena events. And we'll, you'll see a lot more on that here in just a moment. The uh, physical parkland lease area, the physical land area is generally the same as included also in the 2009 lease, with the exception of the arena and the arena staging areas. And you're familiar with, with those two areas. Um, those are in the lease proposed to be retained by the city. And we know that's one of the big question issues, so we, we recognize that. Um, the uh, proposal for the future land use area is included in the Kenwood Park Conceptual Master Plan, and that'll be presented by HDR, and you'll, you'll be able to see that uh, visually and be able to ask questions, and, and they can provide better insight into the planning and the input they had. So I'll let them do that, not steal their thunder. Um, the, the physical park site building improvements by both parties, uh, this is included also in the master plan that'll be presented by HDR here in just a, a few minutes. The continuation of the Tri-Rivers Fair, we felt it was important to assert, we know that's a very, very important thing for you, for the residents of the county, and really for the region. So we wanted to assert that uh, uh, it's our intent to accommodate and support that uh, for the full lease term and, and however long into the future that would be. Uh, we understand the importance and, uh, and agree with that. I want to talk about the county's use of the Tony's Pizza Event Center. Um, the current lease, the 2009 lease, allows for the use of the facility for 12 consecutive days with some advance scheduling notice. The rent is currently set to the operational costs of the facility unless an admission uh, charge is utilized. If there's an admission charge activity, then in that case the lease says the rent is based on the established facility rental uh, rates. In the proposed lease, and, and this is important because as, we, as I mentioned, we have in our proposal are looking to retain the property where the ro current rodeo arena is for other recreational uh, parking and other uses. And so obviously the first question is, is well, what happens with the fair activities? And that's, that's a big question. We get that. And so what we're proposing is, is those activities can come into the Tony's Pizza Event Center. You can bring dirt, you can do ro course rodeos, you've seen that. You can do demolition derbies and even uh, combine demolition derbies. Really anything you can get into the big door uh, you can do. And we've seen that. We've actually seen it as close as Topeka in their expo facility. And so they, they've already uh, shown us you can accommodate those things. So we're saying those things can come in. We're fine with that. We'll have to still work out details with uh, Spectra, who manages that facility on the city's behalf. But we're willing to do that. Uh, and we can do those activities. You still have your, your, your draft horse show. Uh, and really, any other activities, if you may have uh, thoughts of other activities you'd want to put on the list, that's perfectly fine. And if there are activities we don't think of today that we think of in the future, we can agree on those in the future. So really anything that building can handle could potentially be considered as activities uh, for the fair if, they, if the fair board and you should wish to do that, and we can accommodate those in there. So that's our intent to try to do that for the long term. Um, what we'd uh, like to do is, is uh, as I mentioned, all those activities, uh, we mentioned rodeo, demolition, derby, combine, and anything else. So I think that's really, really important that we are able to do that because what we don't want to do is provide a situation in which you don't have space or room for those activities and it affects the fair. We don't want to do that. Now the rent part is really important because as you first look at that, you say, well, okay, we get that and that might be nice space, but there's a cost to that and we know it's, con it's a conference center, it's an arena, and there's, there's a cost to using that and how is that going to be addressed? And so generally, 
we would at this point apply the same concept that's in the uh, lease today because we also have an agreement with Spectra and we need to honor that at this point in time. Now at some point if we, uh, when we get to the point of renegotiating that, if there's a need to change that, we can certainly look at that. But what we're saying is, is we recognize from your perspective uh, and the fair board's perspective, you can't go into a situation where even if you accommodate those activities, you go into a hole financially. So what we're saying is, is we will make sure that won't happen. We'll work with, with your staff and whomever else we need to to establish kind of a benchmark to know where your break even point is with that. Uh, and also, in essence, if we know that there's probably some form of a positive in the, in the fair at the end of the year and how these activities affect that to make sure you don't go backwards in any way. We don't want you operationally to go backwards in any way. We really want just the opposite. We want you to, to be able to do more and to be more successful in there. So what we would try to do is, is uh, and this is in the detail language that we'll have to work out later, but make sure that we have a benchmark, make sure we understand, everyone understands the benchmark, that the uh, net financial impact for the fair doesn't go below. It actually is at or better, higher, more positive, in, in with regard to the benchmark and preserves current income margins, possibly enhances them. Our hope is it enhances them. And so if we have to, there's a few ways that could happen. Uh, we've, t we've talked about paper credits. I'm not sure the paper credit in our current uh, lease or agreement with Spectra will fit, but it doesn't have to. If it does, it's great. We can, you can, we can use that. And I won't get into the detail how that works, but that's a, an option for us that would benefit you as well. But if not, it might be a direct payment to Spectrum. We may simply say, here's the marginal difference and we'll make them whole. It's making ourselves whole, in essence. They operate on our behalf, so we could do that. Uh, we just want to be sure that we don't punish them in their agreement with the bottom line in the end of the year. So we could do that as well, and there are any other options we can come up with to make sure that you're comfortable with that. We will look at those options for you. The financing of improvements. I know we've had some talk on that. Right now our proposal is that each entity would finance its own respective site facility improvement costs with certain exceptions in there. You'll see the exceptions on what I talk about for each entity's pieces when uh, Eric comes up and talks about some of the facility changes. Um, the uh, improvement cost estimates and pros proposed allocations are all in his presentation, so he'll be able to get you to that and, and, and uh, explain those, those numbers and their uh, thoughts behind those. From a timing perspective, when, when Eric comes up and speaks about that, the first one of the questions is, is what's the timing? And our general thought is, is that we believe that the Smoky Hill renewal, renewal construction will probably trigger the timing of a lot, if not all of, all, all of the improvements. And so uh, that is likely to be, I'm going to call it 2020-ish, somewhere in there. It's not a, a set just yet. But based on our current uh, scheduling for that project, that's when we think it will fall. So for right now, that's where we would say it would fall. But uh, obviously, we have to do a little bit more work with that. Some other considerations uh, we've thought about. Uh, one is a financial contribution to the fair. We believe, that I think your city commissioners, your city staff, everyone believes that the fair is, is, a, is a, it's a great event. It's, it's, we, all we all look forward to it. And we want to see it succeed. And so it makes sense to, to help it and make sure the financial health is solid there too. So we would uh, negotiate into the lease to contribute not less than 10,000 annually in addition to the net uh, even and all the other stuff we just talked about and to the fair to make does sure it's city, viable. Does the city currently uh, contribute to the fair? No, I, I, I do not. So. All right, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, so that's one thing that we would like to uh, uh, throw in there because we agree with the importance of it. The other thing is, is uh, uh, we have the, we have a couple signs. We have an entry sign on a, a, very, a brand new marquee sign on Ohio, and then there's the older sign that's over on uh, Kenwood Drive. And uh, I, I, we've had conversations, and I can't tell you today to what degree the county events in that park are on those. What I can tell you, though, is that we would uh, formalize the ability to use those signs for those types of events that we'd call them tourism, events that would draw what are overnight stay type events, the bigger events. And so we would, uh, we would definitely want to preserve your ability to use those signs to advertise those events because they benefit not only the park but the community and the county as a whole. So we would, we would formalize that for you. Uh, another thing that uh, I think you kind of have opportunity is the naming of the park. Right now it's Kenwood Park, and there's nothing wrong with that. You go on, you get into the park, uh, at least from Ohio Street, which is where a lot of traffic comes in from out of town, on the Midway, which doesn't seem to correlate with much. We have an, a county exposition center and facility, 
and a Tony's Pizza Event Center. So we have all kinds of different names associated with different pieces and not a lot of continuity. So our thought was, is, well, you know, if we're gonna look at some changes, why not look at the renaming of the park? And we're not locked into anything, and our thought is, is first of all, your uses, and even some of our uses are, exp are, are like exposition. You obviously have an expo center, so they're exposition-oriented uses. And so why not try to bring that in to create that general theme? And so we threw out just a couple examples, but there are no predetermined uh, notions on what that name might be. But uh, if, uh, if for those who, I'm not sure how much loyalty there is to the Kenwood name, I'm not that familiar with the history. If there isn't, it could be simply called Exposition Park or something like that. Um, if there is, you can shorten Exposition because you want a name that fits on signs and all the letterhead and all of that. So Kenwood Expo Park is another example. So those are just examples, but the thought of brainstorming a name that provides a little more synergy to the older uses we thought might be a good idea and just kind of threw that out if, if that's something you'd be interested in doing. We, th we thought also that uh, for continuity, wherever you go there, you might re want to think about renaming the street so there's commonality there so people really get it when they're, when they're saying, using those terms, that they know exactly what they're talking about, especially for outside the community. Inside, people know where to go. Um, hotel convention facility development. If you look at our existing strategic plan, you'll find still that there is reference to a hotel development and the hope for that in this park. Uh, you're going to see a plan that doesn't include that. So if w once we agree, and I think at some point we will agree on a plan that works for everybody, we would uh, be expected to take that to our governing body and, and particularly with the uh, hotel development that's, that's occurring downtown. I'm not sure there's a need for that, so obviously you would see that be removed. And then uh, finally, uh, public development opportunity. Uh, that's also in the 2009 lease as well as the hotel piece. Um, at this point, I, I, I think if we have a plan, there's not this, we're not looking at, well, what would a potential public development opportunity be? I don't see that being a factor anymore, so we would also revisit that in the lease. And I, I think once we have a plan we all agree on, I don't think we need to have anything like that in there. So that would be a consideration for the governing body as well. So those are some of the key terms. Those are very broad-based uh, pieces and concepts. They're certainly subject to negotiation. And again, we're gonna, and you'll see more detail in the, in the park master planning presentation here just in just a moment, uh, but hopefully gives you a perspective of where the, the city is at this point in time subject to further conversation. And hopefully we match up in quite a few ways, if, if not all of them, and we do recognize there's a lot of discussion and a lot of detail that would be associated with all those pieces. So with that, we're gonna have, I'm gonna have Mike transition over to uh, Eric Dove with HDR Engineering and his presentation. He will give you all the, he'll give you the pretty stuff to look at. I just gave you a bunch of words, so. <laughs> and then after that, we'll be, I will try to answer any questions you might have. So thank you, right. appreciate thank that. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, my name is Eric Dove. I'm an engineer with uh, HDR, and I've been working on the design of the Riverwalk and uh, the River Renewal Project for the city. So I wanted to talk a little bit starting there and why uh, Jason mentioned that the timing uh, is, is really excellent for as we design the Riverwalk and the River Renewal elements, why this ties in so closely with the Expo area. Um, First, the, the ground that we're looking at, so this is an existing aerial where you see Tony's Event Center. Up in the far right is where the arena and the arena staging area are, so that's part of the county's lease agreement with the city. And then the area highlighted in yellow at the bottom of the screen is currently where the expo is. So those are the two areas right now that uh, are uh, under this lease agreement. Um, and from this photo, you notice the river walks all the way around it, basically encapsulates it. So I want to talk a little bit more about that as we uh, go forward. And then from um, property lines and property layouts, uh, you see all the boxes representing all the private property off to the side and then the public right away. And what you see is basically all of Kenwood, uh, except for very minor areas, are uh, basically a whole contiguous lot. When we worked on the River Renewal Master Plan, we worked with uh, three public meetings. Uh, we've had over uh, 2,700 Facebook Live downloads. We've had over 1,000 surveys completed, starting to work on what this master plan would look like for this initial phase and uh, working through those improvements. 
And so this is just a, a plan view uh, showing some of the elements that would then uh, work into this area. And the need for a Kenwood East Gateway, a, a grand entrance into the Tony's Event Center, was really echoed with a lot of the public comments. <coughs> this is one of the renderings we developed. Uh, this is right at the Greeley area, but this is also indicative of the entire walkway coming in through Kenwood Park. Some of the elements that you see are the water that we're going to have and the close proximity of the trail to the water. We visit with the public and the steering committee if we should put the walkway up on top, up on the existing perimeter roads. And everyone thought you lose the intimacy with the river. There's really not much value in, in that. So where they wanted the trail and the walkway is right down next to the water. And then we're going to take these walkways right underneath bridges. So the midway right now is a box culvert. We'd swap that out for a bridge. And so uh, this is a wilderness walk where we're going to try to save those existing overhead trees and really make it a, a beautiful space. We'll also shelter from a lot of the roadway noise and make this a really a beautiful walking area. Um, right now, the, the trail would follow federal guidelines. So we're looking at a 10-foot wide concrete trail with a two-foot shoulder on both sides. To fit this in, uh, on the left, you see the retaining wall there. And the retaining wall would be anywhere from two feet tall to as much as seven or eight feet tall in certain areas. And the reason is right at the top of slope, there are large trees. And then there's all the perimeter roads, the Kenwood Park, north and south, right at the top of slope. From an engineering standpoint, I am not a fan of walls. They're, they're expensive to install. And then for the people that have to maintain it, uh, they're a hazard. And then I have three boys. That's the first thing they go for is climbing on those walls. So from a public safety standpoint, I'm just not a fan of retaining walls. So if we were to eliminate the retaining walls, we'd be into the middle option here. So on the left is keeping the retaining walls, saving the trees at the top, and saving the roadway at the top. The middle option, we could slope it, revegetated with more desirable trees. And we've already had the city forester go out and start looking at the trees that exist at the top of the slope. The majority of them are in poor shape and are not desirable species. So we could do a better job with reforestation and develop a more attractive river walk if we can slope it. But in taking that space out, we will take out portions of the perimeter road. And a road to nowhere obviously wouldn't work. So under option two, the middle option, we would take out the bulk of the perimeter roads. And then the last option uh, comes up every once in a while, but perhaps we can save a portion of the perimeter roads, at least as a phasing option, and run the bike trail up there. Uh, but again, the steering committee, the public, don't feel that's a good long-term solution. They'd want the trail near water's edge. So taking a look at option two, if we were to take out the perimeter roads, there would be some cost savings, potentially a 1.3 million in cost savings coming around the Doxbow within Kenwood Park. So walking through the costs, you'd see 1.9 <coughs> in savings for the retaining wall right off the bat. But as we approach some of the uh, bridges, we'd still need some retaining walls, but you could see vastly reduced. There would be a lot more grading and landscaping. And so it's not all cost savings, but in the end, you'd save about 1.3 million. And again, I think the long-term use would be better. So I'm in favor of reducing retaining walls wherever we can, potentially sloping back, but also taking out the perimeter roads. So you can see how immediately this has an impact, how the expo functions, how that area functions, and what that would look like. So I'm going to have uh, Troy get up and talk a little bit about the layout that we, uh, we developed and what some of those uh, impacts are, and I'm available for questions as you roll through this. So uh, um, just let us know after, after Troy is done presenting some of the layout. Thank you, Eric. Troy Henningsen with HDR Engineering. So this is a master plan we've come up with here to kind of see how this could be uh, redeveloped or, or changed. Um, so this, is this the right way? There we go. So the perimeter roads have been removed, and we say the perimeter roads, everything from um, the YMCA Drive, this is Greeley here, and all the way over to um, the Midway. All those be removed on the south side, 
as well as on the, the north side where it wrapped around the, the arena and the arena staging area and the old swimming pool up there. So that's what we mean when we say removing those uh, perimeter roads. So what that allows us to do is get a little more room to, as Eric mentioned, grade that slope, get the trails in there that a lot of the people uh, desired based on our, uh, our public meetings that we've had. So taking a, a look at uh, how this how this could be changed then. So the Greeley Avenue, that's that rendering that Eric showed with the, with the water in it, um, that's at this location here. Um, one of the ideas is to, since we don't have those uh, perimeter roads any longer, is to extend Greeley up to the midway. So this allows us a second entrance out of the, up out of the Tony's area. So not everybody's going out in Ohio. Um, it's a, a signalized intersection there as well, which helps with, uh, with traffic flow. Um, but of course, this is right where barn number two is located. So um, one of the costs there would be re removing and relocating or building a new replacement to barn number two there on the, on the expo site. Um, then looking at the, the parking lot here, um, the existing parking goes to about this area currently. So the parking lot for Tony's would extend further to the east. Um, and then we would have the a pedestrian link here, a widened landscaped area that would be lit with pedestrian level lighting um, to make that connection um, from the parking lots to the events spaces there. Um, also on the southern or southwest parking lot here, there'd be some improvements to the access points into the parking lots where there'd only, there'd be limited number of, of entrances there for in, in the future, if they they did want to charge for parking, they'd have the little more controlled areas to to collect money and tickets into that uh, into that site. Um, and then on the Expo Center site itself, we've so also I forget which number was it three, four, and six barns as well would would be removed and replaced here with uh, this is a new barn. So. All the horse stalls that are currently there, we've, we've matched that number. So we've, uh, we, there's, uh, yeah, okay, I guess that would help, wouldn't it? Okay, yeah, these are some of the points I've, I've been talking about. So there, there you see the expansion of the parking lot and the um, Greeley Road extension. There we go. So here's the, the three new buildings we're showing. So the barn two replacement is this um, L-shaped building here. Um, then the replacement for barns three, four, and six is this barn location here, the rectangular one. And then the one of the desires attached to Egg Hall would be a warm-up building. So. Zooming into that a little bit more, you can see some of the things I was pointing out. So the controlled access points here to the parking lots. Um, here's the new barn or the warm-up area here um, with wash racks um, inside of those. Um, and again, there still is circulation here um, for, for the uh, Expo Center parking. Right now it's currently a gravel parking lot and there's no control really in where people are parking there. So we tried to create a, a plan where there's more definition of where trailers and RVs might be able to, to park in there. Um, it still allows for the, this is the existing area where there's some electrical hookups. There's 10 electrical hookups in this little corner by the old fire ring here. Um, and under this plan, we're showing that fire ring. We didn't know how sacred that was, but we're showing that being preserved under this plan. Um, but there still is the opportunity to, to utilize those 10 electrical hookups as they are uh, currently used today. Um, so within this parking lot, there's an ad additional I think 18 or 20 spaces that we're showing there. Um, and of those, 12 of those would be uh, electrical hookups. Uh, basically, every either side of the the islands in the middle and then each one of the stalls on the, the ends would have access to water and uh, electrical there. Uh, you can see this little dash here. That's where the existing roadway is, the dash red line. So you can see how close um, we get to that. Uh, one of the, the comments we heard was a lot of these trailers, you know, they, have, they need room to turn around. So we've allowed this, uh, this access drive to continue along the back here. Um, all the way up to Greeley there, so it makes an easy exit or, or deliveries and service area or unloading or loading, whatever operations need to happen uh, can, can ha occur along there. And it doesn't have to be open to the general public. We can close it off on the, on the end here and have access control, so it's not just a, a free-for-all. People going 
back in there. It can be closed off uh, wherever you need that to be closed. I'm going to let Eric come up here and talk a little about uh, some of the costs here um, for this. So that layout uh, was a result of meetings with uh, HDR, the city, and the county talking about their use. So there's no net loss of horse stalls. We've replicated every one of them. Also, the paved parking area is uh, the same square footage as the gravel parking area there. And so the, uh, the rodeo space would then be moved inside. So we believe we've replicated the full fairground use with the new layout. We don't think any of the uses would necessarily have to change. Working through what potentially could be a, a, a county city cost breakdown, uh, the Greeley Avenue extension we show goes right through barn two. So if we show the Greeley Avenue extension, uh, the landscaping, the lighting, the storm sewers are all associated with the Greeley Avenue and the plaza between Tony's Event Center and the Expo. That's roughly two million. And then the barn two replacement would be about 0.6. And then the parking lot expansion, so that's mostly the east one and also um, some of the renovation on the existing parking lot would be about 0.7. So about 3.3 million is what that plan would consist of. On the county side, um, you can see how we've uh, added the, the breakouts. The showers and locker rooms were uh, one of the uh, fair elements that they talked about as well as the warm-up building. Uh, so we've added the shower and locker rooms uh, adjacent to the warm-up building. So potentially Ag Hall could also utilize those showers and uh, <coughs> locker rooms. <coughs> All the building exterior improvements would be geared toward the aesthetics of the facilities. <coughs> um, and we'll show you what some of those aesthetics could look like, uh, consisting of reskinning, uh, fixing some of the windows, some of the elements that you'd see from the outside. And so uh, as it breaks down, it, as we show, it'd be 6.9 million in county costs. Here are some of the uh, existing building uh, refinishing options. Uh, apologize, it's a little hard to see, but uh, an EFIS system, if you're used to that, is basically a stucco system. That's in the top left. And then there's a variety of different buildings uh, the existing Tony's Event Center, for instance, is uh, basically a, a brick or a stone on the bottom and then metal above. So that's some of the options that uh, are available. We think Ag Hall would benefit from new windows, probably tuck pointing some of the brick, and then putting new canopies and uh, really uh, uh, elaborating the front with new landscaping. So we included all those costs and what we show is the county cost. So I want to make sure you, you kind of had a vision of what that could consist of and what that could include. Now obviously these are high level planning costs. Uh, we haven't engaged an architect to actually do the programmatic cost, uh, but we think we're in the ballpark of what that, that could consist of. But that would be one of the things that um, I think the county would want to uh, hire an architect and really start to dive in on um, what some of these building features would consist of. And um, with that, are, do you have questions, either from the river renewal standpoint, uh, the current layout? Well, I, I, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes, sir, I do. Um, and I'll, just a couple, three that are preliminary anyway. On, on the very, and I'll go through it as you, as you presented this thing. In the city-county lease portion of it, uh, that you're proposing to do away with the arena area and the arena staging area, uh, and the arena then would go inside, as I understand it. Yeah. Where would the staging area be then become uh, for the event center? I, I don't know of anywhere over there where they can park trailers, uh, you know, uh, warm up horses, uh, uh, the, you keep all the, sh uh, the, uh, the buck and bulls and, and uh, horses and things like that. Where, where would that happen? So we have um, uh, potentially some uh, parking lot agreements, shared use parking lot agreements that would have to be developed between the county and the city to utilize the existing parking out there. With our proposed plan, um, we'd actually be gaining parking stalls by the tune of 172 parking stalls. So we'd like to see uh, those parking better utilized, potentially with a cost share agreement or a, a shared use agreement. Um, 
but I, I, maybe I'm not making it clear then. I'm talking about the staging animals mm -hmm. or area for the animals. I know you can't keep those on concrete and, and, and in padded yes, areas, and there's nothing over there that, that would uh, take care of that. Right, so that would be a, a lost area that could potentially be utilized by the fire ring or some of those other areas down in that area. It, it seems to me, and I, I mean, I'll, uh, I'll defer to the, to the fair people and, uh, and uh, Rick Lamer on that, but uh, if you're trying to stage a revio and mm -hmm. you've got your animals, you're, uh, you know, five or 600 yards away mm -hmm. and coming over concrete to get there, I don't see how that's going to, I don't see how that's going to fit. One of the elements on the plan that we looked at was a potential warm-up building and then a way to convey animals across um, Bob, Bob Fam Framley Drive. Um, there you go, thank you, um, to Tony's Event Center. So the paving that we're talking about, the, the brick pavers, uh, are intended to be covered uh, to help convey animals over to Tony's Event Center. So we would like uh, some sort of that warm-up area, staging area, uh, to be under roof in, in that particular area. Well, I'll, I'll get off of that subject because I don't know enough about what I'm talking about, but I do know that th those animals have to be staged uh, in close proximity to the building to get inside. Uh, mm -hmm. Bob, I want to make sure I'm, uh, I'm understanding the, oops, excuse me, the issue. The the issue is the distance between if the rodeo is in the Tony's Pizza Events Center, right? And yes. trying to, okay. Yes. We'll, we'll need to take a look at that then. Okay. I, I see what you're saying. I wanted to make sure it's not so much the space because we thought the warm up facility, but the warm up facility connects to Ag Hall, Which is but you still have to cross the street to get to Tony's Pizza Events right. Center. We'll take a look at that. I see, and, and I see yeah, the concern. And, uh, and I would, you certainly don't need me at that meeting, uh, but you do need the, the rodeo <laughs> people and the fair people. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that makes because sense. Because they're going to be a lot more knowledgeable of that. Thank uh, you. I'll move on to my uh, my second question on the river renewal cost, the two point nine million dollars. Is that all a, a cost that's associated or assessed to the county? No, back uh, go, go back to the first part. That one, that that entire two point nine million. That is a that is a county cost. No, so these, these costs are what it would take to build the river renewal project, which is anticipated to be a city cost. Okay, so that- Now part of it might be, we hope the Corps of Engineers would step in and help with some of these elements, but, so that's, but that's, yes. So that's not relevant to what the city no. is gonna have to, okay. So well, the city is either looking at 4.2 million if we leave the perimeter roads in place and build the retaining walls, or the city is looking at 2.9 million if we can slope back and impact those perimeter roads. But in sloping back, we, we do change some of the use within Kenwood, okay. which is why we're bringing it up now. Sure. Uh, as we design it, we, we'll need to know those. And then, and then on the next uh, city and county cost, uh, there we go. Uh, I mean, is, are, are these pretty well set in stone here as far as, I mean, uh, I'm looking at uh, the warm building for $2.3 million. I would want to get with my uh, fair and rodeo people, with Mr. Lamer, who, who schedules the events, and find out what we really need there. Uh, is, is it really important for one event a year to have that warm-up building, or, or if we only have two horse shows uh, that, that really need that building, do we really need to spend $2.3 million on that? That would be my question, but, uh, uh, and so therefore. Absolutely, that's a great question to have, and I think really that's the next step. What we're trying to show is the relative magnitude, kind of a relative breakdown, uh, the beginning of a discussion of what that might be. Kay. But absolutely some programmatic uh, development n is needed to s really start breaking it down. Uh, interior finish, how many showers are inside right. versus outside. Right. Uh, you know, what those wash racks will consist of. That, that those are all elements that will impact the cost. And I'd like to think we're in the middle I, I would suspect you could do it less expensively or more, depending on the finishes you choose, both interior and exterior. Absolutely. Well, I, I commend you on the plan. Uh, I'll tell you, the citizen in me says, man, this, this is it, let's go. Uh, the, the commissioner and the taxpayer in me says, hold up a minute. So um, <laughs> that's, that's where I'm coming from. I, I do want to address the, the park lease a little bit further with Jason, but I, I want to hold on, well, let's, let's kind of finish this first. Uh, to see if other commissioners may have some of the same uh, concerns or different concerns than what I have. So uh, 
I'll yield to any other commissioner that wish to. Oh, I, just a quick question on this on the slope deal uh, and the savings here. Uh, is that I look at this going around? Uh, does that just on the north of Greeley up around that way, or is this all along the river that you expect to do this? Uh, basically, YMCA through the midway down to the next bridge okay. crossing. So I just can't imagine there's there's enough room there to, to put that slope on a, around on the where you have this the new RV sites and all of this that there's enough room there because that road is pretty close to the the river over there on that uh, south side of that. Yeah. So but the uh, this image and I apologize it's a little hard to read but there is a red dash line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right through here, and you can see that's the existing road. So what we're doing is we're moving the river over. We're basically one whole roadway footprint. So you can imagine where the road is now. That will become slope. Gotcha. gotcha. Okay. But that that master plan part of it really doesn't pertain to us, does it? I mean, we're not paying. We're not. No, we're losing. <laughs> but there's an impact to yes. it. That, that's, all he, that's all he can yeah. to yeah. us to know. Because the road's going to have to move over and yeah. All mm -hmm. right, I understand. And, and that's what I look at around the way that we are able to get into the back of 4-H and Ag Hall and Kidwood Hall now. And I look at this proposal here where there's no parking there. All there is is these big sites here for these trailers and stuff. So all the parking for all of those venues would be across the street over here. So the, the gravel area now mm -hmm. would basically be changed to a paved area. So I, I don't. Well, this green here is not actually grass. He's talking the back of the 4-H. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there's, there could be drives that, that connect there, there. I know there's some overhead doors there that. There could. I, one of the things we'd like to do is, for instance, in the front of Ag Hall, it's all paved. Um, not an attractive space. We would really like to see some substantial landscaping done, some of the pavement removed out, in, out of front of Ag Hall, mm -hmm. and start making that a, a more attractive entrance. And so we haven't shown maybe some of the drives that would go back to a loading dock on 4-H. Yeah, but that's uh, what I'm saying is that. We don't really want a lot of parking right in the back of 4-H. Um, so if that could be done across the street, that would be more desirable. Okay. but but. Uh, but it's that that's tit for tat because it's one of those things where once if you have all the venues going and you have this rodeo supposedly going on here, mm -hmm. that whole parking lot area there is going to be full of trucks and trailers and yes sir cattle animals. So there's not going to be parking there for anybody. So they're going to be parking way. But well, well just across the street. Yeah. That yep. that's what we've yep. always imagined. But anyway. Yep. Yeah. One of the the visual concerns that both the city and the county commission uh, have had is the uh, utilities. Are, the, are those uh, in any of those proposals? Are those buried? Put a, you know, moved? Anything like that? Yeah, we we envision that when we uh, redo this area, we'd bury the utilities. Okay. Which and one so we do have utility relocation costs as as part of those costs that we show. Okay. And in which budget line are you showing those? Uh, which one of these? Uh, We've basically broken that evenly down between county and city. Uh, okay, but I mean, uh, in, on the county share, is that in the building exterior improvements or is it in the demolition and landscaping? It's in the demolition and landscaping okay. improvements, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I think, unless there's further questions right here at this stage on this part of it, I, I, I would, would like to ask, uh, uh, Mr. Teasley or Ms. Norwood, if, if they have any uh, questions of the engineers from a uh, from your viewpoint uh, and from the fair standpoint. And Thank you. Kim Norwood, <laughs> Tri Rivers Fair Board President. Um, I just I have just a couple of questions and. There, I have really a lot of questions, sorry, but I'll just, I'll, I'll try to go <laughs> with just a couple, a couple of them. I know that the um, Fair Board appreciates the top consideration through all of this. I appreciate the mentioning multiple times, but I also want to be sure that consideration is given to 
the total usage of the park and the facilities. There are, there's a charity horse show, there's auctions, there's a farm show, there's a cow show. There's lots and lots of things that go on at these facilities. And the fair gets mentioned a lot and we really do appreciate that. But I think that we have to remember practicality for people coming and using these facilities. That is probably the most important thing as opposed to aesthetics. We have in discussion of parking and, oh, it'll be, we just move the rodeo inside. That sounds like a really good plan on paper, but when you talk about bull hauling trailers and cow things and sheep and all those things that make up part of this, um, we really don't have much place to put them. There isn't a place, but well, we can park them here in the, at the, in the parking lot. We, it's concrete and livestock and concrete do not go together. So please consider that. Um, I think we would have appreciated, I know that you mentioned that you talked to the city and the county and some of those things. I think that there um, would be nice and would be nice in the future as you modify this if you speak to some of the actual users of the facility. Um, there are 4-Hers that have events there. There are auctioneers. There are lots of things going on. And I think that if we're going to make these major modifications, that there should be discussion with them to find out what would really benefit them with these kind of changes. I appreciate the fact that you're <coughs> discussing that there's no loss of stalls, um, no loss of parking. But when looking at this, there seems to be a lot of trees in the way for parking on some of the lots when we bring in big trailers that have to be turned around. Staging areas are hugely important. Um, the, it's great to have more hookups and I'm really glad you're not getting rid of the ones that are there. I like to see things remain practical. So those are some of the questions that I had. Um, like I said, I would just appreciate more conversation with some other people and discussion about what is actually needed. So, okay. and I don't know whether, um, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Right, thank you. Please? Oh, Linda. I, I presume you're with the fair board. I am, my name's Linda Lilly and I'm fair board secretary. Okay. And have been for a number of years. I love what you guys have done so far. I think that improving the conditions over there is only gonna get better. I do have concern with the rodeo outdoor arena being removed. Um, I know statistics show that we've not been using that a lot. I have lots of ideas with Mr. Lamer over here. One day we'll get together and see different ways that we can actually utilize that. It's been there a long time. I'm old, I kinda like old things that stick around. We could use, utilize that a lot more than we are right now with um, several of my friends are barrel racers. We could have lots of events over there th and use that more. So I've got ideas for that. But I w I'm just coming up to invite, you guys come to the fair. If you've not been there, we're just a couple months away. Come and walk around, uh, conditioners, please come over there and, and our kids put in tons of hours. Come over there and look at how the facilities are used and then see what we need. As Kim mentioned, parking is, we're landlocked. Parking is a nightmare for these horse trailers. We have some people that bring eight long, I mean, it's like a semi for, to put eight horses in a horse trailer. It's a really pain to turn those around. So please come over, visit, uh, spend some time with us. Maybe you'll get more of a feel of how we actually use it and the needs that we really do have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'd like to call on uh, Rick Lamer for just a second, if I may. And Rick is our director of our uh, Expo Center. Uh, and, and I'm sure that, Rick, you've got some questions in regards to this. And, and, and what, I, what I would really like to propose is uh, to take uh, Ms. Norwood and Rick uh, to meet with you guys, uh, you know, throw us out of the equation there and, and, let, and listen to what their proposals are, what they think, and what that might add to it or take away from it, um, both in cost, uh, aesthetics, and so forth. Uh, th they're the ones that we need to get involved to, to make, it, make it work, make it feasible. So uh, go ahead, Rick, if you Thanks. have. Um, my main concerns is on the parking. Whoops, I don't know how you work this thing. But where you have all the RV parking in the, the which is currently the sand lot is what I call it. But you have 10 spaces, 10 RV spaces. I would rather see them, if you're gonna add more, add them to that south end of that lot, straight across there, and then keep the rest of that open parking. Go ahead and pave it, but it, it would just be open parking. Because there's no way, if I've got 
something in Kenwood, something in 4-H, Tony's Pizza Event Center has an event going on. There's no way all them people are gonna park in that parking lot. I'll have the back of 4-H clear full of cars. If I have, happen to have a horse show at the same time, normally that whole river bank would be full of trailers. The parking lot would be full of trailers and cars. Behind 4-H would be full of cars. I mean, it's just a parking nightmare. And that this all this does is make it a lot worse. Okay, and that, this is the very thing that I think that I'm trying to to uh, present in front of you guys is to from the people. I mean, Rick's worked over there for more than 30 years, I think. Uh, 37 years. 37 years, <laughs> and 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 then I know that the fair board people have been involved for multi years. So uh, realistically, I, I think you guys need to sit down together and 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 see if there's a the common ground there. I want this to work. Uh, I, the, the, the other four people up here with me want this to work. I, I, I think everybody in the community wants this to work. Yeah, and I, I, I appreciate you guys working on it, but a couple other things that I'm noticing on here is on the, the north side of barn one, you have all that landscape. I have to be able to get land, livestock trailers through there some way, and that's showing nowhere to do that. Um, and on the west side of Kenwood, I need all that area for trailers to turn around and unload into that building. And that's showing that it's green space. I mean, that's just a couple things I see on the plan. Besides, you know, the fair's losing the stadium, so they're gonna have a lot of hurdles to jump to figure out how they're gonna put on a rodeo or a demo. Um, Another show that could be affected would be the farm show on the back side of Ag Hall. I mean, that's exhibitor space now, but I don't know if Carl's here. I'm, I suppose they can move to a parking lot or, I mean, I don't know. And currently that's also where the fair has all their concession trailers, which last year we had 10 of them. I mean, if that was eliminated, where would we put those for the fair? I mean, that's just some question. You may want to decide if the warm-up building is desirable, if we'd rather have that as parking, uh, there's, there's some trade-offs that could be done. You, you, you've hit on a very good point, and a very sensitive one with me anyway, and that is the real need for this warm-up barn uh, for, for the limited amount of shows that we would put on it uh, if we do need it. That's 2.3, number one, it's 2.3 million dollars. And number two, it's a lot of space that uh, perhaps we can use for something else. That's, that's, uh, that's the concerns of someone who doesn't know what he's talking about, okay? I mean, for, so. years, for years I've heard the shows say they need a warm up area. Right now what we do is set a 100 by 60 round pin, not covered or anything, that's what we use for a Warm up area. I, I totally understand that, and and I'm for the warm up area too. But again, I'm looking at uh, 2.3 million dollars here. Right. I mean, I, th I, th I think I talked to you the other day. Uh, the county engineer told me two years ago, for a 100 by 100 foot by 80, just a covered warm up area would be around 175,000. Okay, then I'll back up and say that's where you need to talk to these guys, give them a more realistic idea of what we really need, uh, not not uh, an engineer thinking of this, per perhaps, no, no, don't oh, mean no, to offend you, but uh, maybe, what, maybe what he's talking about is the covered area uh, will be a lot more, will be feasible for us, uh, whack off a couple of million bucks out of the thing, and now all of a sudden I'm starting to, my ears are perking up, you know. And I think what they're proposing here is showers and indoor wash rack, which we'll be needing them because they're taking out, they'll be taking out one wash rack, moving barn two, and the other wash rack will be gone when they take out five, so. Okay, so th therefore, I'm, I'm getting back to my main point. Uh, I challenge you guys to uh, to get hold of Mr. Lamer, and, uh, and then he can invite who he wants to from our either from uh, Roger as an example is on the uh, fair board uh, board. So uh, stick those heads together right quick and, and give them uh, what we really what we really need. We probably should have done that in the first place, but 
We needed to see we a. Had initial we needed to see a proposal. It, it was a while ago. We, we needed. We needed to see a, you know the initial proposal, which we now have. So, uh, I, I think that's the track on which to follow. The path to which to follow is to to uh, hook you up with the engineers and the architects and uh, and proceed quickly. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's my op offer to you know to challenge. So. I have some folks with the charity horse show that would like to speak. Well, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not taking further oh, okay. public comment just yet. So, uh, do fellow commissioners have any questions of Rick or no. any, any other no. suggestions in that regard? Okay, thank you, Rick. Yep. Okay. Um, at this time, I, I will <coughs> ask uh, if you'd like to come. To, didn't mean to cut you off before, but. I, I'm trying to do this systematically rather than just all over the board. So. According to Robert's rules. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My name is Yvonne McCarthy. I'm the manager of the Salina Charity Horse Show, um, which has been a Salina tradition since 1941. So I think we have some real, we've got some skin in the game here as far as what goes on with the new developments. I would encourage you guys to come to our show. It's in the second weekend of October, and you can see we have several different breeds. You can see how people need to get to barns, how trailers need to maneuver in and out. Right now it's a bit of a challenge, and I think if you take some of the space away down there, I was worried about the width of that perimeter road the, behind the facilities. It would be a one-way. Okay, well, see, that's, that's going to be an issue. <laughs> <laughs> because if we have a full barn one, we need to access at least three sides of it with trailers or trucks or something because we'll have all the exhibitors that go with the horses, which we usually count about three people at least per horse, so we've got <coughs> at least 300 some people wanting to get in there. Wonderful. Yeah, and I think with these improvements, I'm really encouraged because mm, six years ago, we brought $25,000 into the community with our show because we bring people from out of state, from Oklahoma, from Colorado, Missouri, Nebraska, you name it, they come. Um, I think with these improvements, we could really grow the show and make it into another marquee event like it used to be in Salina when the Giltners had it. And, and Rick, you're, a, you're aware of her concerns or needs? Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay. I so. just wanted to encourage these gentlemen to come to the show. It's free. It's a lot of fun. Bring your kids. <laughs> um, I would like to put in a, a word for the warm-up arena. I agree with you, Mr. Vidrickson, about cost. But basically <coughs> what we need is something covered and with a fence around it. Doesn't and have and to again, be I know that Mr. Lamer yes. is fully in tune with that. Mm -hmm. So I think we can I think we can maybe meet some common ground there. Absolutely. So Thank you. Good points. Um, the points that we're making, I don't know if anyone else wish to speak with that. And and I was just getting ready to call on city commissioners to see if they had uh, something that they wish to or the city. So you're invited to the podium. Uh, Melissa Hodges, uh, Salina City Commissioner. I think just to kind of reassure everyone involved, um, at least speaking personally for myself, and of course the other commissioners can speak to, to what they had hoped to see come out of this process, but what I had hoped to see was I felt like we had had a couple of meetings where you very generously came to the table and gave us some ideas about how, um, what, what you would propose to improve um, the Expo Center. And rather than continuing to say, you know, to respond with, eh, I'm not sure if that's enough, I'm not sure if that's consistent with the investment that we're going to be putting into the river or putting into um, the Tony's Pizza um, event center. I think that we had reached a point where we felt that we needed to be responsive to you and at least give you a concept of, of what w the kind of investment that maybe we were looking for. And I, I, I think maybe, you know, and, and, and I, I certainly mean no disrespect to any of the, you know, to the fair board people or to, you know, the horse people, but I, I'm not sure, obviously there was um, a great deal of effort put into this, but I think we're kind of moving into the next stage of, you know, is a one-way street appropriate, warming barn, yes or no, um, that are, are conversations that maybe need to be had more within um, the expo. Um, uh, community than maybe with uh, the city, but I think that this was just something that we kind of wanted to challenge ourselves um, to take a look at the whole campus and see 
let's look at it in a way that we that maybe we haven't looked at it before. So um, I guess I would just encourage all of us to look at this as maybe more of a um, um, you know an alternative higher kind of higher level ideas to to maybe look at this in a way that we haven't looked at it in the past and um, to thank HDR so so much and for um, city staff and and all the people that who have given input um, I just would really like to extend my thanks um, to the great work that they've done so far and you know just encourage you whether you know that's working continuing to work through you know with HDR or um, you know, through processes with, um, you know, within the fair community to, you know, come up with, you know, what the, the vision that truly serves your patrons best. Yeah. And, th and this is helpful, at least, that, that w we have something visual to look at because mm -hmm. six months ago, I wasn't aware that Greeley w was going to be extended. It makes sense. And, and so then that, that changes kind of, uh, you know, what we're able to do. So, yeah, we have to see that. And, and right. what they had mentioned about the river and the, and the slope and everything makes sense to me again. And right. th but it affects that space. It shrinks it a little bit. And so, n you know, now, now we have some, some work to do on our part. And right. so I agree with you. I mean, you, right. were, you have done, you have done <laughs> what we have asked you to do at that meeting is to right. come back with us. And so I'm appreciative of that. So. And, well, and, and if you've noticed, uh, we're not picking apart conceptually what's, what's really going on here. <coughs> it's just a matter of <coughs> some logistical things uh, to do with staging and things like that. Absolutely. So I think it's well put together. And a absolutely. And there are things that are, I'm sure are totally unique to a charity horse show that, you know, and things that are totally unique to what 4-H'ers um, need and, you know, Frankly, I mean, I knew that, that that asphalt and concrete isn't you know isn't great for for livestock to walk across. But you know, you, when you start to get into some of those practical considerations, um, I think that you would be very well served with the uh, with with the with those patrons. So thank you very much for right. for thank taking you. the time. This thank morning. you. Uh, at this point, I think I, I will go back to um, the Kenwood Park Expo Center. Uh, lease proposal and, and uh, address Mr. Gage on this. The two things, Jason, that, uh, that I have circled here most is n number one is the lease effective date. And I really appreciate the fact that you have really put that on the front burner uh, to get that done by the end of the year. That, that is most important to me. I will tell you that I, I, I find it from my viewpoint, uh, 25 years is uh, for this type of investment is unacceptable. Uh, I, I would like to see that uh, extended quite a bit more than that if, if we're talking about a lease. But that's, I'm speaking for my, my own viewpoint. So if anyone else has a, a questions <coughs> of him or addresses or, I mean, and again, I, I would, I would uh, prefer a, a minimum of a 50-year lease. Mm -hmm. So. What's the, what's the consensus? I, the, the 25 years uh, came from really two pieces. One was is trying to match the life of the investment because you're really looking at your, your investment. At, it's not, you really can't life cycle it more than probably 25, 30 years. And also, you guys had had some prior conversations and uh, had spoken about 25 years. And I don't know if that was consensus, but that's kind of where it came out of. And we know before, we're talking about 50 years, <coughs> it'd be helpful uh, if you have consensus on that, if, if you can communicate that to us, that'll give us something that we can talk about. Yep, we can do that. Uh, and we could do it quickly, too, as far as that okay. goes. So, uh, other, other questions of Mr. Gage from the commission? We will, yeah. we will get you an answer on that, uh, I would say, uh, <coughs> within a, a day or so okay. on that question. Coming back to some of the other comments on the site as well, um, what, I'm, what I've heard a lot is, is the, uh, they're logistical, I agree with you, it's about parking, movement, and access. And that is something we can go back and work with and refine. We're, our, our scope here was a little bit higher than that on that site. Sure. So I think that's pretty easy to go back and look at that and see what ideas we can come up with to modify and, and, and make everybody comfortable with that. Okay. Thank Mr. You. Chair, I think this is a little bit like the communication thing that we just went through. Yep. I, I think I've got to digest this a little uh, bit too. And <laughs> I've got to walk the site and well, kind of just get, I, get I my I totally agree with you, but so. I can assure you I'm a whole lot more clear on this issue than I am with <laughs> 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 that, that those sub towers or whatever they are. Yeah, we're dealing with something we know. Yeah, and well, and I feel confident. I mean, I feel confident that we're making the right progress by putting Mr. Lamer in touch with the, with the uh, uh, architectural people 
And I think that'll that'll solve the put it put it all to bed as far as I'm concerned. I'm pretty sure that'll happen quickly. So did you have something, Jim? I, I just HDR has been working on the on the city's dime on this, and I don't know how long. I mean, we can't keep going. Expect us to go back to HDR and, and the city keep picking up the dime to to <laughs> mitigate all these things. So realistically, at some point we have to do it uh, internally or something. Well, uh, yeah. again, I think I think. Uh, the, the concept here is, is going to be an easy solution. I, I, I trust. Maybe maybe I might be wrong. There might be a lot more to it than I think. But I've uh, are you are you from a space perspective? Are you open? Going to the map here, we talked about that fire pit. Is is that we just presumed that that may be a space you wouldn't want to uh, uh, you know do anything with. If it if it, it is a space you would certainly you can expand parking. We, it gives us some flexibility as well. Not a lot, there's, no. but there's a little bit of space in there. That's a more of a question for you. And so we kind of know what our parameters are. I don't, I don't are. even have a, a, a viewpoint on that. Rick would probably be able to elaborate with it. I don't know the significance of that fire pit that was there when I started working there. <laughs> I don't know how important it is. And the it sad part is you aren't going to gain much room if it is demolished. So yeah, there's not a lot of room. There's yeah. a little bit of room. Let's digest it a little bit, Mr. Chair, and we'll just I'm move totally on. Agree. Okay, okay. And we appreciate that. We recognize, too, this is your first look at all of this, and it's going to take you a little bit of time. So feel free, any questions, concerns, thoughts, we'll uh, uh, immediately start uh, trying to get back with the users and see if we can work through some of those okay, issues. thank you. I am going to field another question from our uh, uh, Kansas State Extension Office. Uh, Mr. Carl Garten has some concerns or a question, whatever. Carl Garten, Extension Service. I guess the only thing I would bring up, there has been one group that, it, that we haven't mentioned here at all whose site will be completely tore out there, and they've poured in a lot of time, effort, and everything into the Master Gardener's demo garden there. And so I just want to make sure that that is brought up and mentioned and something's done with that. I realize it'll probably have to be relocated to a completely different place anyway, but. Uh, you know, that is one other thing that's there. Very good point, If I didn't Carl. bring that up, I'd be shot, so. <laughs> <laughs> Very good point, Carl. And uh, Jason's writing it down. I can see that, so yes, sir. Um, as far as the Master Gardeners area, we did think through what that might look like. And let me get, yeah. All right, so the Master Gardeners are pinched. They're in this tiny little area here and the stream bank is failing and starting to take out their entire area. So either we get back into retaining walls to preserve that space, which is very expensive. And again, you heard me before, I'm not a fan of retaining walls. But with this new park entrance, this grand entrance, we are looking at some nice features here, but we have this greenscape here. So someone would have to maintain that. Someone would have to take care of it. Why not have the master gardeners relocate to that area? This would be a beautiful entrance for them. They'd have much better visibility and more space. Um, so this would be a, a perfect location for them to reside. And we even put a cost to potentially what that grading would be and to provide water and irrigation and relocate some of the facilities to that area. So I think it'd be a vastly improved area that we don't have to worry about that failing bank anymore and, and spend a lot of money to preserve this tiny little post stamp of a, a garden that they have. Good point, and we'll, uh, we'll uh, assign all of those duties to the city, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your cooperation. <laughs> all right, I think uh, at this stage, we can pretty well put this to bed for the time being, and uh, uh, we we're going to act quickly, and, and we expect you two guys to all get this job done and uh, uh, see if we can't come to a conclusion for uh, Salina and Saline County and, and uh, the Fair Board and every other uh, uh, venue that, or uh, show that comes over there and, and put it all together. Want to want to thank the city commissioners and the city staff and the mayor and and uh, for their cooperation, and uh, we look forward to. Uh, uh, partnering on this thing. It's been a great so 24 hours. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that having been said, uh, we'll move on to uh, item number eight. Thank you, HDR. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Policy 4050, non-sufficient funds. 
with Marilyn Lima, Human, Human Resource Director, and Jim Du Bois, County Treasurer. As you exit, I too want to thank everyone who has participated in this, and, and uh, thank you very much, and the public also for coming. So, uh, good morning, Marilyn. Good morning, Commissioners. I had recruited uh, County Treasurer Jim Du Bois to help um, present or the overview of this particular policy. Um, we did not have a policy in place, however, there was a practice in place uh, within the Treasurer's Office and there was a recommendation to create a policy on this. So from there, I'm gonna let Jim take it. Please. What we're looking for is to, to have a policy that everybody could recognize, that everybody knows exactly we're on the same page if you do happen to receive non-sufficient funds, what happens to those funds. Uh, generally, they do come to us. We do send out a letter uh, expressing that it has to be paid. We do charge him $30 for a non-sufficient fund into that process. Uh, we do ask that either cash or money order be sent to us. Uh, if we do not get uh, any response back uh, from them within a seven business day period of time, seven days of receipt of a certified check, then we work with either our county counselor, we work with the county attorney's office uh, to try and get restitution for those funds. The problem is, is that after uh, a couple times that we receive uh, non-sufficient funds, we do need to notify that department and say, hey, listen, do we want to continue taking bad check uh, from that particular person? And, and which puts, uh, you know, we're talking about the dollar and so we're talking about stress that could be on multiple departments within the county. Uh, and talking with Mr. Manley, uh, we figured that there was probably 60 people that actually receive uh, cash or checks or some kind of funds in there. And also, the, the one thing we don't want to do is, is uh, when somebody has a bad check, is come in and take a credit card and, and try and recover that. Uh, credit cards do bounce also, believe it or not, and we do have a whole page full. We do keep a list of everybody that's on the non-sufficient fund list in there. Uh, we could also take a look back, or the department head or elected official, whoever, can take a look back after four years and say, hey, listen, you know, uh, this person has come here, they've paid regularly, we haven't had a problem in there, do we want to reinstate them and put them back? We understand that there's hardships that do happen in there, but also understand that we all need to be on the same page, too, for non-sufficient funds. Okay, questions, questions of staff. Sounds like a reasonable proposal to me. Yeah, you guys make it way too easy for me. Yeah. Pretty cut and dry. No, it's <laughs> okay. I don't think hey. anybody likes to deal with uh, insufficient funds we, situations. We so. do not. We do not. But we there are we looking for, uh, what do I want to call it? We want to make sure it's universal all the way across the county. Okay, Mr. seeing no people in the public to comment on this, I'll... Mr. Chairman, I move the, uh, yeah. Sorry. Mr. Chairman, I move that we approve policy 40-50 as requested by staff. Let's second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that we approve policy uh, number 40.50 as requested by staff. Is there further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank move you, on to item Thank number you. nine. Policy 40.32, Purchasing with Andrew Manley, Assistant County Administrator, Director of Finance. Good morning, Mr. Manley. Good morning. Uh, in front of you is the procurement, purchasing, and contracts policy that we've been working on for the past couple of months. Uh, this is the culmination of all that work. Um, all the highlighted sections are the substantial and material changes. That's not to say that there was other, some other reshuffling organization within the policy, but I wanted to highlight the, the, the big changes uh, so we can address today. Um, much of it was for improved flow. So the first thing you'll notice is the, the subject, the title of the policy has changed to procurement, purchasing, and contracts. It's more inclusive of everything that we're going to be talking about. I added an index because of the, the length of material that's in here. It'd be easier to, to, to know what's in this policy. Um, on to page two, uh, we still have the three levels of, of purchasing. Again, this is a lot of organization. Under level three, uh, wanted to be more clear and purchasing exceeding $10,000 should be sent out for competitive sealed bids. 
Um, under receipt of bids, uh, we wanted the ability to accept emailed and fax bids. Um, mm -hmm. If the bidder elects to do that, um, it was submitting their bid via email or fax of it, vendor understands and agrees that said submission will not maintain the same confidentiality as a sealed bid. We give them the ability to submit their bid, but if they do it, it's already open at that point in time. It's their choice. Um, so if they do that, they understand that they can't say the confidentiality. It's, it's an unsealed bid at that point in time, but we wanted the mechanism to allow that to happen. Um, under award, we added some language in lieu of accepting any bids submitted pursuant to co the competitive bid process. The county retains the right to accept goods directly from suppliers designated as state suppliers for the specific product subject to bid. Um, this is a practice that we don't, um, we would not like to practice all the time, but it does give us the ability to purchase directly from a state bid. Um, moving on is the local purchase preference. This is about the most material change to this policy. I'll go ahead and read the entire policy. Uh, if a local bidder local is defined as a business dom domiciled in Saline County is outbid by a vendor domiciled outside of Saline County, the local bidder may be deemed the preferred bidder if the amount of the local bid is within 1% of the low bid. The local bidder agrees to match the low bid by filing a written agreement to that effect within 72 hours after receiving notification of being deemed the preferred bidder and the quality, suitability, usability of the materials or goods are equal. So that is, again, new to this policy. Um, move on. Um, under competitive sealed proposals, um, the entire uh, highlighted section is a new definition or a new intro to what proposals are. It was kind of a little unclear of when you should use the competitive bid process and would you, when you should use the proposal process. So you, you'll use the proposal process when there are multiple results or ends are acceptable. So we're not really sure of how to achieve um, a result. We want the vendor to propose that. So that's kind of the general idea. Um, previously, the RFP was most commonly used for professional services, but we wanted to expand that to allow it to use for, for example, the cell phone was a perfect example of a good time to use a proposal process. So new definition, new intro to that section, a lot of organization in this area, but nothing materially changed. Um, on to page six, um, the, this is still ending of the proposals. Um, since an RFP is much more involved it's, it's not just about cost, it's about more than, more than cost. We wanted to just say best proposal be awarded the contract. Um, under standards and standardization and specification guidelines, uh, this is a consolidation from another purchasing policy. I felt that we needed to move all of our purchasing guidelines under one purchasing policy. That way when somebody looks at this, they won't, they'll, they'll know all the rules involved with purchasing this in one spot. So the standardization is about consistencies of materials and the use of specifications. I felt this was an important one. Uh, we need to use language that uh, qualifies vendors are able to compete on an equal basis. The use of restrictive or unfair details that should preclude or reduce competition must be avoided. So we need to be clear and open on our purchasing uh, when we're writing our language. And the last part on page eight involves county credit cards. We had another statement, county credit cards should, uh, shall be used for county purchases only. Personal purchases are strictly prohibited. Any questions? Uh, that's amazing to me that we have to put that in there. <laughs> I mean, I think that would be common sense. So, uh, questions of staff from the commission? Hearing none, I'll, any public comment? Hearing none, I'll bring it back to the, uh, the commission for possible action. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve policy 40-40.32 as requested by staff. Second. And moved and seconded that we approve policy 40.32 as requested by staff. Is there additional comments? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. All right, that brings us to the end of our, our normal uh, uh, agenda. Are there any announcements or other business? Hearing none, I'll take a motion for adjournment. So moved.
Second. And moved that we adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. We will conclude with the meeting number two. Are we going upstairs, Rita? Yeah. Going up